This conference will now be recorded. Good evening. I'd like to call to order this regular town council meeting for Tuesday, June 8th, 2021. Um, Please rise for a moment of silence. So the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Do we have anybody standing in for the town clerk tonight? I nominate Craig. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. No offense, Councillor Fishbein. No problem. I was going to reject it anyway. I nominate Christina. Let's not carry this on. We have a long meeting tonight. Thank you. All right, uh, I'll just call the roll and I'm gonna go in the order that we sit on the dais looking to the near future. Uh, Councillor Tata. Here. Councillor Marone. Here. Councillor Fishbein. Here. Councillor Laffin. Here. Councillor Shortell. Here. Councillor Morgenstein. Councillor Zandri. Here. Councillor Testa. Here. And I am the chairman and am here. Eight present and accounted for. All right, uh, I'm just gonna go through the announcements. Um, hopefully the last of them, I do see a lot of new participants to this meeting. Uh, members of the public, please keep all of your microphones muted during the meeting unless you are the person asking a question. Also, kindly keep your camera inactive unless you're speaking. The system does not deal well with multiple simultaneous speakers. The audio from only one person will come through at a time. Therefore, please only speak if you have been recognized. It's also why it's important to mute your microphone if you are uh, not actively participating at the moment. Um, I don't need a gavel because I have a mute all button and um, I'm not afraid to use it. Uh, We'll now proceed to go through the agenda. If you wish to question or comment regarding a particular agenda item, please type into the chat bar that you do. If you look in uh, one of the top corners, the top right corner of your screen, you'll see a little cartoon text bubble. When you click that icon, you'll see a strip appear in the side of the screen. Please type into that strip uh, your request to speak. I'd ask that we not use the chat bar as a chat bar because then I lose track of speakers. Thank you. Um, I'll first look to for questions from those who are uh, logged in through a computer or a smart device. Once I've heard from all logged in digitally, I'll look for comments from those who have dialed in. Um, if you intend to comment, you must introduce yourself by stating your name and address for the record. There will be executive session uh, later in tonight's meeting. Um, all of those not participating in executive session will be asked to lock, uh, I mean, to leave the meeting. Um, if you're not leaving fast enough, we may kick you out. And uh, then I will lock the meeting. Once the meeting is locked, you can go into the waiting room. And once the, the executive session is uh, completed, I will unlock the meeting and all of those in the waiting room can return to the meeting. Um, and then in light of some recent events, I just want to remind all participants about some rules, the council rules, council four, um, individuals wishing to speak to individual agenda items, uh, 
address, address their questions to the council chairman and limit his or her speaking time to a total of three minutes per person. Public comment is a total of 20 minutes. Um, both members of the public and uh, members of the council uh, should refrain at all times from rude or derogatory remarks, reflections as to integrity, abusive comments, and statements as to motives or personalities. All right. Uh, with that, can I have a motion on the consent agenda, please? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I move we approve or accept consent agenda items A through U. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Noting no opposition, the consent agenda passes. On to the public question and answer period. Um, uh, Mr. Mays, when we get to item 12 on the agenda, you will be able to address uh, the data centers. And uh, Ms. Mooney. Okay. Hi. Can you all hear me? Yes. Name and address for the record, please. Uh, my name's Whitney Mooney, and I live at 28 South Elm Street. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to take the time to invite the counselors and mayor um, and everybody else on this call to an upcoming Juneteenth celebration hosted by the Wallingford DTC and the Meriden Wallingford NAACP. Um, in case anybody doesn't know, um, Juneteenth is a day to commemorate the emancipation of enslaved people in the U.S. This was first celebrated in Texas where June 19, 1865, enslaved people finally received word that they were declared free. Juneteenth is a day to honor the many lives lost, fight for equity to ensure black Americans are treated equally in all systems that are currently oppressed and to celebrate um, the emancipation. Um, we hope you will all join us to honor, learn, and celebrate. Um, and it's going to be um, at 51 Quinnipiac Street in Wallingford from two to, uh, 12 to 2 p.m. on June 19th, rain or shine. And I just wanted to invite you all. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Next up is somebody named Bob. Good evening, somebody named Bob. It's Bob Gross, Long Hill Road. Thank Hi. you. Thank you, Chairman. I have a question for the mayor through the chair. The money that's coming from the feds, have you received any of the money yet from the America Cares Act? Or, and, and have you decided what you're going to do with that money yet? Because I don't know if the mayor is the mayor on. I don't know. I think the mayor's on. There he is. Yeah. Yes, we have not received any funds uh, at, at this point. Uh, we attended an information ses session remote uh, day before yesterday, or no, I guess it was yesterday, and um, received instructions from the office of OPM, state of Connecticut. Uh, the finance department is working on it, but um, we, we will receive the funds from the the uh, state government through OPM. Right. It'll, I know it's a pass through. Question I saw that Meriden had a great idea. They, because of they, they are going to help children or young adults, depending on their age, go to summer camp. In light of community pool not opening this year or foreseeable future, wouldn't that be a wonderful way to help some? people in Wallingford have their children participate in organized activity after the year we've been through and um, with a little of that money help them help the town to be able to do that for the children well as far as I as far as I know I don't think that's one of the approved uses for municipal government uh, Department of Education will be receiving uh, some of money um, that is significant. I believe it's $4.6 million over over uh, two years. And they education certainly can do that. But at this point, I'm not aware of whether the funds for municipalities can be used in that manner. I'm just saying, because I, Meriden, it was 
written the record journal and quoted from people on their council that that's what they planned on using some of the money for. I don't, re it could have said Board of Ed. I don't remember it saying Board of Ed. I just think that would be a, um, considering there is no pool or activities for children, some children to participate in, it would give them two weeks of uh, summertime to participate with other children and for a small amount of money. Um, uh, I, would hope that the town, I would hope that the town would look into that, or at least the council make recommendations to the mayor. I hope the mayor is not making all the recommendations without the council at least having some say in this. Uh, okay. Mr. Gross, let me. Menzo appears to have some information for oh, you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good to see some of you and hear others. Um, the Board of Education is offering a wide range of enrichment activities at no cost to students this summer. Um, and that looks like it'll happen for next summer, 2022, and also the summer of 2023. They range from STEM activities to arts, music, um, physical education, as well as academic acceleration. Um, and those have been messaged out to families, no cost. Um, we're also working very collaboratively with the YMCA and Boys and Girls Club. So uh, we did take advantage of that, as the mayor said, there are five areas uh, actually four areas of the ESSER II funds and five areas of the ARP ESSER funds. And the first area is for academic advancement as well as enrichment. And we um, utilized our funds to make that happen for our students this summer. That's a good thing. Thank you. Um, that's it for me. Thank you. Oh, what, wait, if there's nobody else on, then I had another question for the mayor. Uh, does anybody else... Mr. Gross is offering to yield to another member of the public. I didn't, I'm not looking at. I'm not looking at the, the list here. Um, is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Uh, Mr. Gross, you have the floor for three more minutes. Sure. I see that the uh, town is paving private parking lots behind Simpson Court. I know there was talk of potentially putting in uh, charging stations or at least do the wiring for the charging stations. Is that happening? And if it, if so, will it also happen when you pave the lots this summer, the lots near the police station? Well, given your characterization of the project, uh, I think it's highly inaccurate. Uh, therefore, I, I wouldn't think the town was doing anything where we were doing anything on a private lot. Um, there is a plan to at least putting in conduits other locations such as on the wooding property and also where the brothers restaurants had been so that's why i said so you're going to do them on the wooding kaplan parking lots then when that, it goes into summer the wiring yes, is going to happen the plan is that there would be a conduit I don't know that we'll be putting any wiring. We don't have any specs to determine what would be necessary, but it would be uh, capable of being wired and, and constructed at, at those other locations. Thank you. All right, with that, uh, it appears that that's all we have for the public question and answer period. Moving on to item six, uh, which is a public hearing to consider an act on the 2021 Neighborhood Assistance Program. Mayor, this appears on the agenda as your item. Councillor yes. Todd, before you go ahead, Mayor, Councillor Todd, I think you want to be heard. Yes, um, I just wanted to say I'm going to be recusing myself from this agenda item as well as agenda item seven. Thank you. Mayor, thank you for your patience. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I believe you have a summary list of uh, applicants for uh, the state program. The town holds a public hearing and we would approve these organizations as as being um, worthy of, of uh, being part of the program. I believe there was an additional entry um, and I believe maybe it's, you have noticed that the uh, Church of the Resurrection has been added to the list? We do. Okay, so I, I don't think it's on the printed list, but it is, it has been added as a potential recipient uh, for the program. And as you're aware, this is state tax support 
It is not local government. It is a tax benefit to organizations that support these very worthy applicants for a variety of uh, projects. So in addition to the Church of the Resurrection, uh, who applied for $150,000 for energy efficient door replacement, Columbus House has applied uh, for the Wallingford Emergency Shelter for $120,000. Gaylord Hospital uh, has applied for energy efficiency upgrades for $150,000. Um, and then a separate grant for Gaylord Hospital for patient programs and services for $150,000. Holy Trinity Church uh, has applied for energy efficient windows for $150,000. Ulbrich Boys and Girls Club, academic success mentoring and youth development for $150,000. The Wallingford Family YMCA for Healthy Communities Campaign, $150,000. Wallingford Historic Preservation Trust, the Johnson Mansion, Silver Museum, $150,000, and Wallingford Public Access Association for the WPAA TV, HV, HVAC, and Heating Management Building Underbelly and Attic Insulation, underbelly is a quote, uh, $16,852. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, Mayor, but um, those with corporate tax obligations to the state can make contributions towards those projects and receive credit uh, towards their tax obligations. That's correct. Okay. Uh, this is the public hearing on the, uh, on the application. It's required as part of the program. Are there any comments from the public? All right, uh, Ms. Kofer, name and address for the record, please. Sorry, unmuted. Adelaide Kofer, 35 Wickletree Road, just a quick comment. Um, I would like to mention or, or uh, reiterate that uh, rough estimate, I think about half of those projects are on energy efficiency upgrades. And time and again, I would like to ask the town council and the mayor to please consider such measures for town buildings as well. I think it's a worthy cause. And if there are funds available like these ones right there, please do take benefit and do similar measures for town buildings to the benefit of the taxpayers and the environment. Thank you. All right, duly noted. Any other comments from the public? There being none, I close the public hearing portion of this event and move on to item seven. Can we have a motion, please? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I move we approve the resolution authorizing the mayor to submit neighborhood assistance applications to the State Department of Revenue Services and summary list of programs for 2021 neighborhood assistance program and to exercise any amendments, decisions, and revisions thereto and to act as the authorized representative of the town of Wallingford. Second. Moved and seconded. I heard a second. I believe that was Councilor Shortell. Yes. Thank you. Questions or comments from the council? There appearing to be none. Have we been joined by somebody from the town clerk's office yet? All right. Well, then, I will call the roll. All right. And I've been asked to remind participants who aren't momentarily actively participating to mute your microphones because some of us are perceiving an echo. All right, with that, uh, Councillor Fishbein. Yes. Councillor Laffin. Yes. Councillor Marone. Yes. Councillor Morgenstein. 
Uh, I, I apologize. Councilor Morgenstein did advise me that she has a work obligation tonight. Councilor Shretel. Yes. Councilor Tata. Oh, recused yourself. Abstaining. Councilor Testa. Yes. Councilor Zandri. Yes. And I vote yes. The motion passes. All right. On to item eight, which is to hold a public hearing to consider and act on an amendment to chapter 138 littering and dumping ordinance. Page, it'll say eligibility or click here. Uh, forgive me a moment. All right. Um, there. Uh, Councilor Shortell, as the ordinance chair, would you care to introduce this item? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is the culmination of something like eight or nine months of uh, work. Councilor Zandri sponsored this, I think, in the early fall. And essentially, and I mean, Councilor Zandri, I don't, you know, he can speak to his intent, but I think his, uh, but I'll speak to it too. Uh, he was looking uh, at the fact that people seem to be dumping their trash in town receptacles at various, uh, very, you know, very public places in town, parks, et cetera. And so by increasing the fine for littering and basically adding language, there was no language around dumping. So that's what this, this basically does. Attorney Small, I don't know if she's on the line. She put a ton of work into this. Uh, we, we, you know, we make her life pretty rough as it is, but this one, her life was pretty much all uh, dumping and littering for a long time. So she put a lot into this you know, researching what the state allows and, and in terms of the fines and dumping and the language. So this is the culmination of a lot of work. And, you know, if there's any uh, any high school civics teachers on the line, you know, this is government moves kind of slow sometimes. But, you know, this is this is one of those examples where we move slow, just try to get it right. I know Councilor Fishbein had jumped in with some suggested amendments, as he always does at one point in the process. So, of course, here we are uh, after a lot of uh, back and forth, I think, with a really good um change so that, that that's that's really it i'll leave it to you chairman savoni or, or councillor zandri uh if you want to add it you know whatever you want to add to that mr chairman uh, if you may yeah i think councillor fishbein will allow you to go first uh okay thank you uh and thank you councillor fishbein um so yeah, I mean, just uh, to try to wrap up the introduction, I'm not gonna add a whole lot more to what Councilor Shortell um, identified, because that was a lot of it. But I, I, I did wanna kind of preface a couple of quick, quick items. I, I know that throughout some of these discussions, because it was discussed in the newspaper, I, I got some communications from residents and and it's like what Councilor Shortell said, you know, why is this taking so long? Why are we even focusing on it? And so on and so forth. There, there's a lot of components to it. You know, for one thing, you want people to put the trash into the proper receptacle. And, and that's not what we're trying to discourage here. What we're trying to discourage them is people using it as true dumping. When there, there's a difference between somebody picking up a few items or you know, fast food shopping, uh, you know, fast food bag of something to throw away in a town pail, that's completely acceptable. We would much rather have it there than out on the ground. What we don't wanna have is, you know, the, the tall kitchen trash bags that we're finding put into the receptacles downtown. And it's and it's actually been made worse now because the, the, the uptown and downtown receptacles have all been changed out. So people are forcing the doors open. They're fooling around with the latches to get them open in order to dump in there. So that's a problem. The other part of the problem is at the town parks. These are very large barrels that they're filling up with a lot of household refuse. And there's a difference between when there's a picnic or a party at one of the parks and people are properly putting trash in there to again people coming in with a bag of garbage from elsewhere and putting it in there this is a burden to all the taxpayers when it is being overused slash misused and that was really the the effort behind all of this there are people that are simply not um, maintaining their own personal responsibility for getting rid of their trash and are putting it on the backs of the town uh, through public works and the expense and cost of that because once again forgetting for a moment the the salaries involved with the town having to continually go through clean out these barrels clean out these parks because when the barrel is full people still leave things there 
But the idea is too that when we bring it to the transfer station, we we pay for that. And the money comes out of the taxpayer. So for all the responsible people, you're paying for all the irresponsible people. And we we had no lever or leverage to do anything about it. We could we could set up set up a nuisance report, we could have a police officer look at it, public works gets them involved quite a bit. We can identify the trash, but there's no teeth in anything. We're trying to add some teeth here. So that's really where the where the effort from all this came from. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Councillor Fishbein. Councillor Fishbein, thanks for your patience. Oh, no problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to briefly thank uh, Councillor Zandri for bringing this to our attention and, and pushing to get something done here. And certainly Janice's work on this matter is, uh, you know, really couldn't ask for better uh really a, a good review uh, on this and Councilor Shortel uh for your your leadership on this matter so uh, I think what we have before us is actually a document that you know one person in the past said it takes a village we all had a had a hand in this document and I think it's it's good for our town so thank you Mr. Chairman all right with that uh any comments questions from the public While we're waiting for that, I don't think we have a motion on this item. Can we have a motion to amend Chapter 138, Littering and Dumping Ordinance, as uh, proposed in the agenda packet? So moved. Second. Thank you. There's a motion and a second on the table. Uh, still no public comment. Anything else from the council? There being none, unless I get interrupted by a clerk, I will call the roll. Councillor Fishbein? Yes. Councillor Laffin? Yes. Councillor Marone? Yes. Councillor Shortell? Yes. Councillor Tata? Yes. Councillor Testa? Yes. Councillor Zandri? Yes. And I vote yes. Uh, the Amendment passes unanimously. On to item nine, we have discussion and possible action regarding ASME, Council 4, Local 1570 Police Officers Contract Tentative Agreement for three years from July 1, 2021 through June 30, 2024. Uh, Chief Wright, Mr. Hutt, and yes, Deputy Chief Ventura, welcome. Welcome. Uh, this is uh, Jim Hutt, Town HR Director. Thank you, Mr. Hutt. Uh, we're here tonight. I'm here tonight with Chief Wright and uh, Chief Ventura to seek the council's approval for a three-year contract to run from July 1, 2021 to June 30th, uh, 2024. The contract calls for general wage increases of 1% in uh, year one, 1% 1 in year two, and then a 1.5% GWI in year three. In years one and two, uh, there's also an additional wage adjustment for uh, ranks police officer step two through captain. That's in the first two years of the contract on top of the GWI. Also provides for an increase of 10 cents per hour for the shift differential. Um, in order to uh, uh, retain uh, some employees were looking at increasing uh, the number of vacation days from 10 to 12 for uh, police officers with one, two years, with uh, one to two years of uh, service, uh, increase the number of vacation days from 12 to 15 for employees with three to five years of service, and then increase the number of vacation days from 15 to 17 for those employees with six to 10 years of experience with the town, it does not increase the overall number of vacation days uh, maximum, uh, which currently is at 25. Also, small increase in clothing, uh, and there's an increase in uh, term and accidental death and dismemberment life insurance from $30,000 to $32,500. And uh, for health insurance, uh, these employees are on the HSA, the High Deductible Health Plan. It's the core plan. And uh, 
the contract, the agreement calls for premium cost shares to increase over the life of the contract from 15 to uh, 17%. And with that, I'll take any questions that the council may have. Councilors, questions for Mr. Hutt. Mr. Hutt, apparently you did a bang up job. Uh, well, I'm very glad for that. <laughs> members of the public, questions. All right. Um, as with any collective bargaining agreement, this is presented to us as tentative. Um, it will go into effect without our action. Uh, the only action we could take is a motion to reject. If there is no motion to be made, um, then thank you all. Uh, before we move on, uh, I'm not sure what's gonna happen on June 22nd at our meeting, but I uh, suspect that we may not see Chief Wright. And um, at the end of this month, your time with us will end. Um, I am going to take an opportunity um, to say, that uh, the town of Wallingford has been very lucky to have you in service with us since I believe 1994. You can correct me if I'm off by a year. Um, and uh, you have certainly been a tremendous member of our department with all you've achieved as you've climbed the ranks and uh, when you became our chief several years ago. Um, I. I have to say that um, I think that during your tenure as chief, Wallingford has become a, a little bit better place. And I think it has a lot to do uh, with the way you ran the police department and the relationship that you maintained with the rank and file um, and your work with all the department heads. Um, I think you've been tremendous. Um, I hope your replacement comes close and whoever he or she is, I wish them lots of luck in that regard. Uh, so thank you for all of your years of service to us. Um, your next employer is going to be very lucky to have you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's um, been my absolute pleasure and my honor uh, to serve the town of Wallingford for well almost 26 years now. And um, it's always been my pleasure to come before yourself and the town council. Um, many times I recognize on short notice where I've kind of forced my way onto the agenda for some important matter, one reason or the other. Uh, the council has always treated my, both myself and the police department with a tremendous amount of respect. And um, I truly appreciate that. And um, as I move forward and uh, leave the department. I know that um, it's being left in great hands and a lot of that has to do with the manner in which both the council uh, and the town government uh, led by the mayor um, assure that that happens. So um, it's been my absolute pleasure and honor uh, to serve uh, the town. So I thank you for your kind comments. You're welcome. The respect that you got from this council is something that you earned incredibly quickly and you maintained it i think it was more than appropriate thank you sir thank you uh with that um there being no motion this contract will go into effect uh thank you mr hutt uh deputy chief ventura thank you again chief wright on to item 10 which is discussion and possible action regarding the Board of Education, Custodian, Maintenance, Union, Local 130360, AFL CIO, Council 4 for three years from July 1, 2021 through June 30th, 2021, 2024. I'm sorry. Um, and we do have representatives from the Board of Ed to talk to us about this contract. If you could please introduce yourselves, thank you. Yes, good evening, everyone. My name is Danielle Malithi. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Personnel. And I'm Sal Menzo, Superintendent of uh, the School District. Good Thank evening. You. Go ahead. 
Um, thank you for having us. We are here to uh, present the custodian and maintenance contract. Uh, as you stated earlier, this is a three-year contract. It runs from July 1 of 2021 through June 30th of 2024. Um, as part of this contract, as we moved through and negotiated the wages for the next three years. For the first year, um, the there will be step movement for those that are eligible with no um, GWI. Yeah, also in the first year, there'll be GWI of one and a half percent, only for those who are at the top step. In the second year, there is no step movement for any of the employees, but there is GWI for all of the employees at a one and a half percent. And in the third year, uh, there is step movement for those that are eligible with no GWI for them. And there is a 1.25% 1 1 GWI only for those who are at the top step. In terms of the medical coverage, uh, we did take a look and increase the premium cost share for the next three years. It'll be at 18% for each year for all three years. Um, in terms of their plan for the first year, the um, HDHP HSA plan stays the same as it currently is at the 2004,000. Um, in the years two and three, we did increase their annual deductible to the 2250-4500, uh, along with the coinsurance maximum of 4,000-8,000, and that's in the years two and three of the contract. And the last piece we discussed with them was the insurance waiver. Currently, we have two members that are on the waiver. Um, the waiver has now been decreased at, to $2,000 for family, $1,500 for a two-person, and $1,000 for individual. And that concludes what we um, worked on with this contract. Contract one done. Uh, mm -hmm. Questions, comments from the council for the Board of Ed on this contract? Um, I, I will say that I believe this is the third contract that I remember um, being. Let me see if I can fix that. Um, This is the third contract I remember being presented on behalf of uh, this bargaining unit, the uh, custodian maintenance uh, in my tenure. Um, and I, I repeatedly am told that this is a hard working unit and a pleasure for your departments to deal with. Um, so I just think that should be noted for the record. Um, feel free to unmute yourself. I hit the mute all because somebody was gave Absolutely. me a, yeah thank you um this has this unit is extremely hard working um they are probably one of one of our hardworking units and they are absolutely wonderful to deal with. It has been a wonderful experience to negotiate this contract with them and to work with them on a daily basis. There's never a concern about where they're coming from. Um, they want to do what's best for the district and also for the taxpayers and you know, we are eternally grateful for that with nine unions. It's nice to be able to have a, a union that truly stands up and, um, you know, recognizes the challenges that we face. Not that the others don't, but this one oftentimes comes to the table a lot more ready, much more ready uh, to be uh, negotiating in a realistic manner and a timely manner. That's pleasant to hear. It's, it's nice to hear something positive about labor relations. So um, I'm not seeing any activity in the chat bar from the council, anything from the public. Uh, once again, no action by the council means that this will uh, go into effect uh, on its own. And since you are in front of us, um, I am gonna jump ahead to the addendum that is number 18, which is discussion and possible action regarding the Board of Education food service contract. Uh, UE Local 222-92 United Electrical Radio and Machine Workers of America Collective bar Bargaining Agreement uh, covering July 1, 2020 to June 30th, 2022. If you can tell us about that, please. 
Absolutely, thank you. Um, so with this contract, um, the food service uh, employees are represented by a new union. Um, so the first cover page, the agreement page and the recognition page, it just uh, indicates the new union, uh, the new name change and who they are represented by. This contract is a two year contract. Um, it will go from July 1, 2020 to June 30th, 2022. So the first year is a retroactive year um, for them. In terms of the wages, the retro year, the first year, the GWI is 1.5%. And in the second year for 21 to 22 school year, it will also be 1.5% GWI. We did make sure that the part-time employees for this coming school year that are making below minimum wage will be uh, increased to the $13 an hour to reflect the current minimum wage change that will take effect on August 1st. Um, in terms of some of the language cleanup and some additions, in section 2.4, uh, we did clarify filling vacancies when a position is open and we did just um, put it that it's filed in accordance with the town civil service procedures. Um, in addition, in section 2.7, we discussed and agreed that uh, any employee that is transferred from one position within the food services unit to another, that they will be transferred within the first 30 days uh, instead of 60, which is what we had before. We did have a discussion in section 2.3 or 2.13, excuse me, um, that any employee may be temporarily assigned to work in another school if determined necessary by the food service director for reasons, but including but not limited to the reduced work in a current building um, and the need for additional coverage in another building. In section 3.3, we just clarified and took out the word unit. In section 3.5, uh, we took a look at the recall rights uh, and we determined that instead of having it for two years, we reduced it down to one year for the recall. In sections 4.1 through 4.5, we updated the union membership language so that it reflects the current um, language within the contract. In section 6.3, we took a look at outside activities. Oftentimes our food service employees will um, like to work any activities that we are running within the district outside of their regular work hours. So we just clarified the structure of what that would look like, that it's by seniority on a rotating basis. In section 6.6, .6, we addressed uh, training for new for employees that take new positions and so that if they begin a new position they have to receive training no later than 45 days from being placed into that position. In the section that addresses sick leave allowance which is the new section 8.2 uh, there are 11 sick days per year for full-time employees and part-time managers with an accum accumulated total of 90 days and five sick days per year with an accumulated total of 25 days for part-time employees. Employees who work less than 10 hours per week are not eligible for sick leave. Under section 9.1, we put in some structure and perimeters in terms of when employees can request um, taking a leave. So we just put in the structure of when they can do it and how they can do it. So uh, basically the language here states that they have to include a general statement of the reason why they need the leave. Uh, they provide it to the food service director and it shall not be granted during the first week of school, the last week of school, on the day preceding or succeeding holidays or vacations. Uh, but that being said, it is obviously handled on a case-by-case -case basis, and if there are emergencies or reasons why things need to be changed and not followed to this, the food service director has the right to make those exceptions moving forward. Um, in section 9.2, under uh, bereavement leave, we just added the son or daughter, and we added uh, son-in-law or daughter-in-law as well. We added a section on um, non-discrimination, so we added language in there regarding that. We clarified under the evaluation section um, that food service employees will be evaluated once a year. The evaluations will be conducted by the food service director with information and input from the food service man from the cafeteria managers. Excuse me. Um, we clarified language and added language about personnel records that employees are allowed to uh, request and examine their personnel files. 
uh, at, and they can just schedule a time in advance to make sure that it, we are here and that they have an opportunity to sit down and look at them as well. And in terms of the insurance, the insurance plan is the HDHP plan with the HSA. Uh, in this particular plan here, um, we took a look at uh, changing the premium cost here to be 9% in the first year, 10% in the second year. And the last section of this was the waiver. We currently have four employees on the waiver. Um, so the first year the waiver has remained intact, but it will sunset on June 30th of 21. And so uh, the waiver will be eliminated after um, this first year. So it will not be there for them for the second year. That concludes. <laughs> All right, thank you. Questions or comments from the council? Nailed it, Ms. Okay. Lizzie. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the public? Uh, once again, no action from the council means that these con this contract will pass in its due time. Dr. Menzo, what are the odds we're gonna see you again before the end of June? Um, I don't think they're high. You're not gonna <laughs> like slide another contract in by June 22nd? I, I don't think we could get there. We are, we're in negotiations with uh, two more unions, pre uh, well, four more units, but two presently. Um, and I don't think we'll be able to get it over the finish line just that soon. Well, then this will likely be your last meeting with the Wallingford Town Council. Um, you were hired just before I was elected. Um, so as a town councilor, uh, you're the only superintendent I've worked with. Uh, but I have, whether I liked it or not, paid attention to what you've been up to. And I will say, that your time in Wallingford um, has been marked by a consistent effort to improve our education system without a fear of change. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that is, that is to be admired and, and lauded. Um, I think that you have worked hard uh, for our students and in our entire education system. Um, you know, I think the town benefits from it. Uh, I've been invited to graduation for, since 2009 or 10, 10. And, uh, you know, one thing I'll notice is that this is a town where we've had years where an entire senior class has been either employed or placed or going on to higher education um, from graduation. Uh, Notable graduates who go on to um, Ivy League schools and uh, tremendous athletic programs. Um, and so our school system continues to be something to be proud of. And uh, I certainly think your contributions are uh, worthy of recognition for what the past, is it 12 years, 13 years have been? 12 years, yep. Okay. So thank you for that. I think that Councillor Shortell is not gonna let me be the last word. So go ahead, Councillor Shortell. No, I just wanna uh, acknowledge uh, Dr. Menzo as well, because my first year, my first foray into this whole public service thing was on the Board of Ed for two years with, with Dr. Menzo and with Councillor Marone. Um, I want to say we hired you, Ms. Belize, as well during that. I want to say we hired you during those two years, too. So, but I learned a lot, and uh, you put up with me, you put up with Joe. And, um, but I always, in all seriousness, I always appreciated you, you know, just, just the transparency when we had questions and, and, you know, what just you gave us the info and you told us, well, yeah, we're going to spend this on this. And if this happens, we're going to do that. And it was just the reporting we got, everything was great. And uh, it was, uh, it was awesome. Um, from a business perspective to see how you ran things, how you have run things. So I, I'm sincerely grateful for that and uh, grateful for the everything. The, the one I'm gonna close on this note, and maybe you can email me after the meeting. 
Um, I will say my greatest failure, and, and Vice Chair Laffin, I think, knows where I'm going with this because he kind of agrees with me on this. So if, if you're not a parent, you don't know this, but when there's like a delayed bus or a school delay, we get like 17 text messages and the phone rings off the hook and there's, and as a prank, I've always wanted to sign up Chairman Cerrone to get those texts, but I haven't figured out how to do it. So if there's a way to sign up somebody who maybe doesn't have kids in the system currently, if you could just send that to me before you leave, that would be helpful as a few other people, but mostly Chairman Cerrone. I want him to experience the five o'clock joy when your phone rings because bus 35 is two minutes late. But seriously, thank you for everything you've done. I appreciate it. You're welcome. I, I thank you for the comments. And, um, you know, Mr. Shortell was the rookie even when he was leaving the board. He used that card uh, for, for his terms on the board. Um, it's been a pleasure. Uh, it's so nice to, to be in a place for 12 years and grow the relationships that we've had um, in the best interest for our students. And over that time, working with all the counselors that are presently uh, on the council, as well as previous counselors, um, feeling respected, feeling trusted, um, and also having some really frank conversations. Uh, I think that's the, the key to the relationship that I, I know will continue uh, with whomever comes in after me. I know the Board of Education prides itself in having a good relationship with the town council. I would also want to thank the mayor for his support um, because he has been a, an incredible partner along the way. Uh, but from Mr. Marone and his institutional food to um, Mr. Laffin and his french fries and fried dough, I remember that when he was on the board uh, talking. We talked a lot about food, um, quite honestly, um, with cheese at board meetings and at town council meetings uh, with Ms. Wong when she was in the food services department. Um, but again, over the years, it's been wonderful to serve the, the students and families of Wallingford. Um, I'm proud where the district is right now, and I know that it'll continue to thrive. We have incredible students, and as long as you have incredible students with incredible staff working together, uh, there'll be incredible outcomes. So again, thank you. Um, I appreciate it. I won't be a stranger to Wallingford in a position. We'll be still working together um, on a variety of collaborations um, and be certainly would certainly be looking out to make sure that our students continue to have great success uh, in Wallingford. So again, thank you for your support and Chairman Savoni, thank you for your support as well and for your time and commitment. Um, I'm sorry you're not going to be at graduation this year, um, but again, uh, we thank you for everything you've done. Thank you. Uh, I think Councillor Marone is, is insisting upon a bite at this apple. <laughs> so I just, just a quick story. So when my first foray into elected uh, office, uh, I showed up at my, about my first board meeting and there was 500 angry parents there because of some major changes that Dr. Menzo had proposed. And uh, I was like, what am I getting myself into? This guy's nuts. And uh, he he continued to be nuts for the for the for all the uh, the time moving forward. And the amazing thing was, you know, all these groups that had issues with the plan, he met with them all individually. He reached out to everyone, His like his number was there, he was open to everyone. And I was just, I was thoroughly impressed with how he handled that whole situation. And from that point forward, he continued to impress me with how he he conducts himself uh, as a superintendent, as just you know, as a as a member of the community, so uh, it was really great to um, cross paths with, with you for that time. I learned a lot from you, actually, and uh, best of luck uh, with your next endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think uh, Attorney Fasano, the former senator, might like to be heard. Um, but I'm not going to force him. Yes, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have known Sal for, I don't know, maybe 30 years before he was in education. And I just want to say that uh, I was so surprised when Wallingford and he showed up as a superintendent. It was uh, amazing because I hadn't seen him so long. But I don't think what people really know is the impact he's had on education in Hartford. Sal has brought his ideas that he has started in Wallingford in the high schools of taking kids uh, from high school to good paying jobs in technology. And it's that idea they've been trying to mimic at the Capitol uh, at, at the education department, but they can never do what Sal has done. But that impact is lasting up there. And people talk about him a lot and they try to siphon his knowledge all the time. But I just wanted to say as former state senator, 
I was never, I was, I should say it this way, I was always so proud when I would see Sal on these boards, talking to Governor Malloy, who thought Sal was fantastic. Even Governor Lamont talks about uh, Sal in such high praise. And he's been a standout in education and it's helped Wallingford kids for now and in the future. And Sal, I wish you the best of luck. You are a gem to education because you love it so much. I won't say go Red Sox because that's totally inappropriate, but uh, I just want to say that it's a pleasure knowing you throughout all these years. Thank you very much. I really appreciated your support throughout this. So thank you for those words. Councillor Testa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, um, I've had the good fortune of working with Dr. Menzo both from a uh, as a counselor and within the school system and i wanted to just make a brief comment and it's it's just it's it's nice that senator fazano commented uh on something that i was going to you know i want to reiterate what he was saying that i work in an area that's uh, basically career career oriented and if i would laud dr menzo for for one thing above all else it's the uh, what he's brought to our system uh, to to promote career education, and so many people talk about that, and so many people think that we're not doing anything in those areas, and we're doing so much. And if I could remind everybody of one thing, it's that that there's a lot going on in our school system, in areas programs that are designed to prepare kids for directly for careers. We're going to see a lot more of this. I know we're going to see a lot more of this. He's not leaving, um, but I'm just I'm I'm happy that I had the opportunity to work with him in a small way in that area of the school system, and uh, and and uh, and I want to congratulate him. Take this opportunity. I've had this privately, but I'll never pass up an opportunity publicly to say thank you, Sal, for what you've done for our school system, for our kids. Uh, and uh, looking forward to seeing uh, what more we can do together with you. And uh, Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Fishbein. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hey, Sal, <laughs> nice to see you again. Um, you know, if somebody was to ask me about your focus as a superintendent in four words, I would say useful skills and attentiveness. Um, you know, as Councilor Testa has shared, I think your focus from the very beginning is, you know, let's get these kids prepared to get a job. And we've talked about, you know, the cookie and the coffee shop and, you know, all of those things, those useful skills. And, and, and I have to say, you know, every time I tried to contact you, uh, you were, it was like you were telepathic. In the middle of the night, you'd email me back with, uh, with the answer. Didn't always like the answer, but at least I got an answer. So. I really appreciate that, and I'm glad to hear that uh, you're not going that far away. And you know, I'm sure we'll see you soon. So, good luck to you. Thank you for that. Well, thank you again uh, for your years of service to us. And I think in the time that uh, people have been talking about you, that contract somehow passed. So, um, <clears throat> with that. Um, Thank you again for your years of service and I'll look forward to running into you when we can. Moving along uh, to item number 11, which is discussion and possible action regarding facility and fee waiver application. Um, how this gets before us is we adopted an ordinance a couple months ago and the ordinance requires the council to approve uh, the recreation departments um, facility fees and the waiver ap application. So that's been part of our, that is part of our agenda packet. Um, I guess I will ask, do we have staff from the rec department here? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, Kenny Michaels is here. Good evening, Mr. Michaels. Do you want to chat with us about this? Sure. So as we uh gone through the last couple of months of facility fees and fee structures and now the creation of a fee waiver um after this long and 
I guess, grueling process. Um, I present before you the uh, the fees for facility and park usage um, for for the town parks and facilities, um, indoor and outdoor at the uh, Parks and Recreation Department. Also presenting, as there was never one in place, as we have seen over the last couple of months, that we had to create a facility fee waiver for the usage of town facilities by nonprofit organizations operating their businesses on town property. Um, so those are the documents um, that are before you that I put together over time and over the last uh, month, I have sat down uh, with the mayor per his request um, to come up with this document and make some revisions to the document um, before it was presented to all of you. Thank you. Uh, first up from the council, Councillor Fishbein. I'm gonna I'm gonna pass for now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Marone. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I uh, I agree with Mr. Michaels. This was sort of a long, grueling process, but I really appreciate the work that he and uh, the mayor uh, and the law department put into this. Uh, to get this going. Um, but my only uh, quick question for Mr. Michael. So according to the document, I understand the, the fee waiver. So um, if a, a nonprofit group was to have an indoor event, the only thing they would be responsible for then would be the cost of custodian or whatever other fees were associated with the event. Is that correct? Th that is correct. As long as they meet the criteria as a um, in good status 501c3 organization, the only fees that would be responsible for for that event, if it was indoors, would either be custodial fees, custodial supplies, so on and so forth. Okay, thank you very much. And again, thanks for your work. I'm all set, Mr. Chairman. No problem. Councillor Testa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm trying to decide if it, the question, answer to my question is in the document, but I, I don't know. Uh, Mr. Michaels, thank you. I appreciate all your work on this, and you've been you've been available for any time uh, I've got a question, and uh, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm curious, when somebody, an organization applies for a waiver, uh, what is, what are the criteria? or are there criteria you're going to use to determine whether that's granted or not? Is that the sheet I'm looking at, or is there, is there some other way that, to, that you're, you, you know, that you would make that determination? Sure, uh, Councilman Tessa. So if you look at the, the documentation, it has the eligibility, uh, eligibility and qualifications, and it also has the eligibility requirements. So as long as the organization meets everything in uh, the first eligibility and qualifications and then the seven items on the eligibility requirements, um, as long as they meet all of those in that criteria, then, then the fee would be waived. Um, well, I, I'm reading it. A lot of it is, is um, procedural they have to follow the, the 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 proper procedure to do it is there a i'm trying to find something that would allow you to even deny anybody you, does this make any sense like who who would you say yes who would you say no to if someone's applying for a waiver uh, as i'm reading it if i if i may mr michaels it says eligible organizations, Wallingford-based 501c3 organizations may request fee waivers pursuant to the written requirements set forth in this regulation. And then it goes on from there. So, uh, so you know, if anybody, well, so if anybody that that's a true nonprofit that follows the procedure should be should be uh, should warrant or is that? And I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just trying to understand how it will be applied. Does that seem like the way it is? 
and the criteria go on below that. You know, there's a list of qualifications. There's a bunch of boxes to check. Yeah, but it seems most of it's procedural. So not not organizationally definitive. I don't know. Oh, that makes any sense. Must provide uh, must be IRS 501c3 in good standing with a Wallingford business address. Right. Well, I'm, I'm okay with that. I just um, no, there's more. There's there's more. It must provide documentation, bylaws dis demonstrating its activities are exclusively nonprofit. List of programs and activities sponsored by your organization, the Town of Wallingford. Produce documentation that the program to be held at the park facility will have at least 80% Wallingford residents as attendees. I mean, there's all criteria there. I, know, I love it. I honestly do like it. I think it's it's good. I guess, the, you know, the elephant in the room seems to be travel leagues. So it's, it's an organization that, that that's what we're talking about in a lot of cases. Uh, are we zeroing in on uh, an organization needs to demonstrate that they truly are nonprofit? Um, and that would seem to be the, the cutoff point. I, I, I think that, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Fair. Uh, no, that's okay. Kenny, you, you want to take it? Sure. I, I I think you know going through it's 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 just it's focusing on groups. We we've been running into, um, you know, organizations that want to utilize town property or or town parks, um, to the benefit of the business. And some and some people are calling themselves nonprofit. Uh, we ran into a, a situation with a baseball program, uh, where they're calling themselves a nonprofit, but they they weren't filed or registered as a 501c3. So when I when I question them in regards to their nonprofit advertising, the response was, "Well, we didn't make any money last year." Well, when I asked what you know if they have a 501c3 certificate, the response was, "What was that?" So that was just one instance that we dealt with this past fall. <clears throat> we also see another organization that you know I have some rec commissioners who are student nonprofits who are looking online for, for up-to-date 990 tax filings for some. And if you know nonprofits, nonprofits have to have their 990 tax filings as public information, and some of them are not posted. So are they not in good standing? Are they not up-to-date? I mean, the focus isn't really just on, on travel baseball teams. It's, it's on nonprofit businesses as a whole. I, I appreciate that. And... And I, I apologize if, I'm, if it appears I'm challenging you. Uh, I'm, I'm actually want to make sure that you've got everything set up so that you can administer this as you have explained to me you wish to. And I want to make sure everything is in line to take care of those situations. Um, that's why I was asking. Um, so I guess that, that answers my question. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I my other question is going to be Going back to our ordinance, um, how are we handling this as a council? Are we approving this this evening? And it's take it and run with it and administer it? Or is the is the table set so that an organization that is denied a waiver can appeal to us? Uh, so our ordinance didn't require an appeal to the council process. It just required council review, the the amendment we made. Um, so our our job tonight is either to approve this or to send it back with recommendations or to send it back without. But um, that's what it's here for. Our, our, our modification to the ordinance now requires us to approve it or not. I'm with you on that. Is all of our understanding the same that we are doing this with the understanding that organizations will not have the ability to appeal to us? Councillor Testa, that was not Mr. Chairman. Mayor. Yeah, I think uh, given that the council approves this, if anyone is complaining that it's not being uh, it's not being implemented in a proper manner, of course they, they can they can come to the administration, the law department. They certainly can come to the council. Um, there's a there's an aspect to this that 
sometimes is missed, and that is we're acting as a as a as a regulatory agency, really. And and once once you begin to exact fees, you have to have a pretty strict sense of standards to avoid impartiality, to avoid what is called capricious, uh, biased uh, decision making. So the effort here is to make it very clean. If you're a 501c3 organization, you're entitled to get a bid waiver. If you're not given that bid waiver, then and and a decision has to be written if it's as to the reasons why it's not granted. Uh, certainly, if someone feels that they are being improperly treated, they have a variety of places that they can make known uh, their belief that uh, this is not being implemented in a fair manner. But under administrative law, you you have to have strict standards. It can't be just because someone likes someone or they knows they do a, know they do a good job or they've been there before. No, it's it's a repeated, consistent set of standards that encourages and allows everyone to believe that they're being treated fairly. I'm all for that. I just want to make sure we're all in agreement on this. That's all. I like it. I I just I wrote I wrote I, I raised the questions earlier when we were passing the ordinance. I. I just don't want to see a situation where when Mr. Michaels and his organization is administering this, if someone disagrees, they feel they can come to the council and ask for an appeal on this. Um, and are we, how do we, what do we think uh, about somebody's right to do that or not? That's all, that's all I'm asking. I'm hoping it's clear cut. Uh, I appreciate the mayor's words, and, I, and it seems to me that this, the the paperwork in front of us, um, is pretty clear cut and does a good job of, of setting out the standards so that they could be, uh, administered impartially. But uh, I don't want the public thinking, that, that, the council is making these decisions. That's what I'm trying to avoid. We are not making the decisions on these waivers. And when we approve this. We are approving not only the, the 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 information in front of us, but we are approving that it's going to be administered by the Park and Rec Department, not by the Town Council. That's all. I don't want that confusion out there. Thank you very much, Councillor Tata. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my first question um, is actually related to what Councillor Tata was just asking. Um, down at the very bottom of the waiver application, the last line says the director of parks and recreation or designees shall determine eligibility for the waiver. If the waiver is denied, the director shall provide a written explanation for the denial. I'm wondering if right after that, maybe we add um, who an appeal can be made to. Um, I think we can just maybe add one line there and say either um, an appeal can be made to the council or to the mayor, or it, then maybe if we just state it there, it makes it clearer. Um, because I, I think maybe there should just be some form of an appeal. Um, you know, like you said, it's, it's very, I mean, the, the eligibility and qualifications seem pretty clear cut, but I'm just wondering if it might make it a little bit um, better if we just put who the appeal could be directed to. Um, so that's my first comment. I don't know if Mr. Michaels wanted to respond to that, but I'll, I'll ask my second question also while I'm at it. Um, and I asked Mr. Michaels about this, but I just, he didn't think it was a much of a need for it, um, which is fine, but I just wanted to throw it out there. I didn't know if we should also maybe mention prorating the parks, um, the per day fees. Um, some of them say $800 for eight hours, and I don't know. Um, Mr. Michaels did tell me that I don't think he's ever received anybody that wanted it for less than eight hours. So maybe we just don't need to state it, but um, I was just wondering if we wanted to, maybe if somebody wants a park for only four hours, they could just pay the 400. Um, so those were my two comments. So uh, if anyone wants to respond or not, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Sure, Coun Councillor Tata. Um, so currently right now, I, I guess this would go back to, to Councillor Testa's uh, statement or question. 
there's the town ordinance 151-12 denial of the permit and the appeal it says any person denied a facility permit by the director may appeal such denial to the commission meaning the recreation commission any appeal must be in writing and mailed or delivered to the department of parks and recreation within 10 days of the date of denial the commission shall sustain or deny the appeal based upon the written record consisting of the director's reasons for denial and the applicant's reasons for the appeal, but may invite the parties to a hearing in any event, the commission shall render its decision within 15 days of the date of the appeal. So I don't know if that would fall under this as well. Yeah, that seemed, I mean, yeah, I didn't, wasn't aware of that. Sorry, rookie mistake. I didn't, I don't have the ordinances memorized yet, but uh, yeah, that does seem to fit it. So it sounds, like from, <laughs> it sounds like from that, that the, um, so the appeal would be directed to the rec commission. So um, yeah, so as long as that's there, um, I think that kind of covers it. So I'm happy with that. Thanks. And then to, to um, and then to answer the second part of your question, um, you know, it, to just listing all the different prorated fees. I mean, th this the, the the pay structure that you all have in front of you is a document that that's been in place in our department for as long as I've been there. Um, it, it's 16 years. If somebody, and, and it doesn't happen often, as I mentioned to you, but if somebody did want, let's say, an hour and a half instead of three hours, we, we have adjusted the fee, you know, if they're only using it for an hour and a half compared to the three hours for the field. Um, you know, those are things that we take based on the, the request of the permittee and things that we work with them during the permit process. Attorney Small. Um, just to clarify, that appeal section is for the permit, not for a waiver of fees. You did not put in the ordinance an appeal process for the waiver of fees. As the mayor pointed out, if someone's denied it, they certainly can complain to whoever they see fit to complain to, but there's no appeal process for a waiver of the fee provided for in the ordinance. And you can't complain, you can't simply just add it to the application form and say it's you get an appeal to the council. That's it would need to be in the ordinance. Okay, well like <laughs> thank you. Thanks for clarifying. Um yeah, well, I guess I mean I don't really I don't really have an idea of what we should do or shouldn't do, but I just um if I could make a suggestion. Yeah. If, if what we're trying to do is create an overt right of appeal for somebody who's denied a fee waiver, um, we can pass what is in front of us tonight and then we can revisit the ordinance to add an appeal provision. Yeah, I, I think that's a good idea. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> that's all I have, so thank you. All right. Uh, if there's no one else on the council, then uh, going out to the public, we have a request to speak from Mr. Doherty. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Sean Doherty, um, two Windswept Hill Road, Wallingford, Connecticut. Uh, when I'm not at 81 South Elm Street, Wallingford, Connecticut, over at the uh, YMCA. Uh, quick cl clarification uh, question through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, under eligibility qualifications, uh, it states that uh, to be eligible for a fee waiver, the park area must be used for a unique and special community-wide event. Um, so the qu question is, however, in bullet points five, six, and seven, it refers to program. Um, I'm just wondering if event and program are interchangeable. Yes, they are. You got an answer. Thank you, Kenny. All right. Uh, we should probably have a motion to approve what's in front of us. If the, I think if the concern is that we want to create an appeal provision, we should revisit the ordinance. Um, 
but something needs to be in place, especially since our ordinance required the council to approve what exists. Go ahead. Sorry, my other keyboard's buried. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I motion that we approve the facility and fee waiver application as proposed by the Parks and Recreation Department. Along with the fee structure? Along with the fee structure. Sorry, I was just naming the document. Yes. Approve and accept. Is there a second? Yep, second. Moved and seconded. Further discussion from the council? There being none, I will call the roll. Councilor Fishbein. Councilor Laffin. Yes. Councilor Marone. Yes. Councilor Shortell. Yes. Councilor Tata. Yes. Councilor Testa. Yes. Councilor Zandri. Yes. Uh, giving Councilor Fishbein another chance. I vote yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, yes. Uh, the motion passes. I will bring up with Councilor Shortell as Ordinance Committee Chair uh, addressing the appeal process. On to item 12. Uh, Discussion and possible action on an agreement with GotSpace for the development of data centers. This is actually on our agenda as an item from the EDC. And we do have representatives of GotSpace with us. Um, when putting together the agenda last Tuesday, uh, I was asked by the administration to put this on as a placeholder as at that point, there was not, the administration had not finished negotiating an agreement. Um, the agreement was presented to us late on Friday. Um, with that, is there anybody from the EDC who would like to speak? I know. Attorney Fasano is ready. Uh, Attorney Small also, uh, I give you the opportunity to address this. Um, do you want me to go through basically my memo or is that what you want to do? That'd be fine. Okay. okay. All right, so we provided with you on Friday afternoon um, a draft of the agreement. Um, I will note that there's some um, cleanup that needs to be done to that agreement. There's some cross references throughout the agreement that need to be fixed based upon revisions that were made. Um, but the agreement that's been provided to you provides um, for the development of the data centers. It provides a list of the properties that are to be included in the agreement. Um, the purpose of specifying the properties in particular is to limit this agreement to those properties so that in the event that um, they seek to have additional properties added to uh, the agreement that the town would have the right to say yes or no or to require a new agreement. Um, it does allow God space the ability to substitute a property for um, one of the ones listed on the agreement if it's in the same zone and can meet the same requirements. Um, the plans that have been circulated out in the public were conceptual, as you all know, and I believe this evening that the developer will provide updated conceptual maps um, and drawings for you to see. Um, I did recommend to them that they put all the property that is listed in the agreement together and be able to show that to you and I believe they will be doing that tonight. Um, as drafted, the agreement does not limit the number of buildings permissible on a particular site or their specific location on any given property. The, um, as you all know, I uh, probably should have started with this, this is, all comes about as a result of um, state legislation 
which essentially makes these data centers exempt from um, all kinds of taxation. And in order, however, for them to be in a particular municipality, they must enter into a host fee agreement. Um, the town has the right to say yes, the right to say no, the right to say some of this is good and some of it we don't want. It's, it's within the um, town's discretion. The host fee that is being offered um, is outlined in my memo, but it's essentially with a, if the building has a capacity of less than 16 megawatts, we will receive 500,000 annually. For each building with a capacity of 16 megawatts up to 32, we'll receive a million annually. And for each building with a capacity of 32 megawatts and higher, 1.5 million annually. There is also a, um, an annual increase of at least 2% or uh, with a 3% cap, depending on the CPI. There will be, prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, there will be um, preliminary payments made, um, which relate to basically to the, directly to the assessment of the property that is currently there. Um, these, this agreement is based upon the state law that requires minimum investment of 200 million in order to get a 20 year deal and $400 million investment by the developer provides for a 30 year term. The town is not obligated to make any improvements. Um, there's still an agreement to be reached with the electric division on terms that are acceptable to both parties. Um, and that is in progress. Um, we have discussed the issue of access to the properties and the concern over um, the use of residential streets, in particular North Farms, Tankwood, and Williams Road for ingress and egress to the site. Um, we've drafted language that says that that is prohibited with the exception of any emergency access required by town officials. Um, the developer wishes to speak to the council about that this evening and we'll do so. But I will just want to point out that um, in the early 2000s, the town engaged in a study of this land that's now looking to be developed. And it was being looked at because it's zoned industrial and the town had an interest in seeing if it expanded an industrial park into these lands, what would it look like and what would we want? And it was the expectation when that study was done that any further development of that industrial zone in that area would access existing streets in the industrial zone, Sterling Drive, Tower Road, and Fairfield Boulevard. So um, we've written um, a draft section that I've provided to you that provides for that. Also the property um, behind the Ring Rose property abuts Williams Road and because there is direct access from Route 68, we also in our draft forbid the use of Williams Road for the development. Um, and if any other residential streets come into play, then we would have to approve that also. Just to keep in mind as you're considering the agreement, um, it's been represented that each building is an approximately an 18 month build out and that they will not be built out at the same time. Um, so that's kind of an important factor when you look at the uh, proposed number of buildings. Um, it's a pretty extended construction period uh, and that might play into your concerns about the use of residential streets. Um, from the beginning of our discussions regarding the data centers, um, the issue of noise has been a serious concern. Um, we did our own research on this and then we ended up consulting with an acoustical engineering firm. Um, our, Research indicates that in other areas of the country, these centers of this magnitude are not normally built near residential uses. Um, for example, Northern Virginia has one of the largest concentration of data centers um, they claim in the world. Um, and I did reach out to officials there uh, because it appeared to me in my research that these centers are generally not near residential uses. I wanted to confirm that and to see if there were any issues. Um, they did confirm that they do look not to have these near residential uses. And in fact, I think most of it was in a formerly agricultural 
um, zone itself. Um, however, it, where there have been issues of a data center near residential uses, they have had complaints regarding the noise. So we also engaged a uh, acoustical engineering firm um, who did confirm to us that relying on a noise ordinance would not be sufficient to protect the residential areas that close. Um, so what the agreement provides, and it's based upon our advice from our um, engineering firm, is to create a procedure for the establishment of what would be an acceptable noise during the design phase, and that would be subject to our review and approval, um, and then they'll be required to comply with it. Um, it's my understanding that, in fact, noise can be dealt with. Um, it may be expensive in some cases, but it's something that can be done, and we do believe that it has really been a very important issue for us as we've had these discussions. Um, so with that, I mean, the agreement is, um, it is what it is. Um, and I guess I would turn it over to Attorney Fisano for his presentation of um, the new drawings. Attorney Fasano, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I can proceed. Yes. Mr. Chairman, uh, first of all, I'd like to just say I have uh, Thomas Quinn on with us, as well as Jim Rossman, who is the engineer who helped design some of the plans we're going to be taking a look at um, and knows the land, as, as well as Tom, because he's, he's walked uh, the land. Um, I just want the council to understand that this process began in March. Uh, I came on board at the end of April, but Mr. Quinn has met with uh, the town administration, being the mayor and Janice and others. Um, I came on in April. We started to have provisions written, uh, and Janice and I exchanged innumerable drafts and had conversations and documents going back and forth. So where we are today has been a culmination of months of work. Um, and I will say Janice did an unbelievable job in looking at all issues, and the mayor as well, um, taking the role as mayor and lawyer, looking at all the issues that were presented in this matter uh, and trying to protect the town. Again, something that is an unknown uh, in terms of being a new thing for Connecticut based upon this law. And it was clear from the public hearing that we had, or informational hearing that we have had last time, that North Farms Road and Tankwood and William Street was an area of concern. And we went back and looked to determine that this was an industrial park. So uh, it was indicated that there might be roads, paper roads already created. And there were two plans put out by Malone and McBroom a while back. One plan did not have any exits on North Farms Road, and the other plan did have uh, exits on North Farms Road. That being said, the town never reserved any rights of way. So these paper streets are owned by others. And in fact, one new development is going on on one. So they've been kind of cut off. Uh, there's also topography issues. Uh, this was done at a high level 10,000 foot what if we did something, this is what we looked at. But we did look at that, and we're gonna to try to follow those patterns as much as possible. But there are land and engineering concerns. We did hear that we uh, should be off uh, the North Farms Road, and as I said, Tankwood, as well as Williams, a um, concept with, with which my client fully agrees with. Um, and so we've come up with the designs that come off of Sterling and Torres, Taurus Road, uh, there are some issues with respect to that. So on the one property, there are three different, um, I should say four different complexes. And the one that is on North Farms, which is a concern, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have Jim put that design, if, I don't know, electronically how you give the power away, but uh, put the design up. Oh, there you go. Or you did it. There you go. Even better. Uh, so if we look at this design, um, you can see that 
on the lower left part of your screen, the entrance into the development is off of uh, Sterling and um, off of Taurus um, Road, and it comes in to the development. Uh, there is no access on North Farms Road. And I'm gonna turn over to Jim to do a little more explanation. Jim, would you mind? Unmute yourself. Good evening. I'm, I'm Jim Rossman with Stadia Engineering Associates. Uh, Mr. Rossman, currently I'm sharing my screen to show these maps. Would, would you feel more comfortable if we shared your screen? Nope, this is totally fine. Okay. Uh, so as, as Len has indicated, we have two means of egress through the, or entrance to this development through the, the existing industrial park. Uh, at this time, we're showing the primary entrance being off the end of the cul-de-sac on Sterling Drive. And there's an alternative entrance off of Tower Drive. Uh, both of those, both of those access ways uh would re require some engineering work that uh would manipulate the topography such that a road could be uh, designed and and created to serve that complex uh as well as uh inland wetlands commission approval uh, we know we're going through some marginal land that's why that those two areas haven't been developed currently uh, I think either of those alternatives at this time would be our uh, our doable options for the entrance into this uh, complex. So, in order to um, in order to show the two alternatives, we're actually showing the same entryway on on off of both Tower Drive and Sterling Drive. Only one of those two entrances would be constructed, uh, and it would be whichever one was more engineeringly feasible and prudent. That, that would be the criteria under which that, that access would be created. So, and I apologize, I call it tourism, I was to say tower. So coming off of there, now there are two emergency exits, emergency uh, access. One is on North Farms, is that correct? Correct. And the other one is on um, uh, Tankwood. The issue on that is if that is required by the town, and only if that is required by the town or the state, uh, we would propose that. And if that is not a requirement by the town and state, these would be gated off, uh, breakable gates. So in case of emergency, they just break right through them. That would not be in and out unless there's a true emergency. But I wanted to note that on the map. So our intention is to stay off of those roads. The issue we do have is whether we come off Sterling or we come off Tower, we are going to impact, at least on Sterling, maybe on Tower, a small area of wetland. Um, so we're going to need uh, some approval through the Land Use Board of Inland Wetland. If we, if we need them on both and we don't get those, what we would propose to the town is if for some reason we get denied on a permit, we think it's a minor impact, but we can't be involved in a large piece of property, enter to a contract with all of you, and then not have the ability to access this property, is that if we were cut off by that, the town would then pick the access that they would like us to use, and then we would abide by that access. Uh, as I said, our full intention is to stay off those roads, but it becomes a land use impossibility. Uh, we can't be landlocked from our own piece of property. So that's where Janice and I have had some conversations, Attorney Small and I have had some conversations and we kind of left that to the council to further explore. Um, I would also add that um, we also want to talk about the ability of a uh, construction purpose entrance off these roads. So if there was a reason that we couldn't get a supply truck or a cement truck into the property by some reason or another, we would like to stick in the agreement that um, 
the owners be allowed to use those roads only for construction purposes and only if notice is given to the town of Wallingford indicating that the other accesses are not uh, practicable given the nature of the construction or the delivery of the item. So if there's a cement pump that has to be put in temporarily, you know, for half a day, we want we may want to come in off of that road for that hour to get in there and then come out. But that would be only done with the permission and consent of the town upon a showing that that is necessary. And it's in construction sites that is done with frequency that you have to use other alternatives based upon the site restrictions. And since we've agreed to stay off these roads, we would need something uh, just in case uh, an issue like that came up. We heard a lot of the issues regarding neighbors. So we have adjusted the buildings so they're further from neighbors. Most of them uh, are, all of them except one, are at least a football field away from a neighbor's house. One is maybe 100 feet short of that, but we can adjust that. Uh, so we are trying to take into account those issues. As Attorney Small said, there was a, uh, we sent a whole bunch of information about noise generators. Uh, Attorney Small took that, gave it to her expert. We can meet those conditions and they're written in the agreement. I just don't wanna lose sight of this fact that this property is an industrial site. If the data centers weren't gonna go in, any industrial building as a matter of right can be built there. No restrictions on visibility of the from dwellings, no restrictions on any use of any of the property, the roadway system, I should say, no restrictions on the noise, no restrictions on the traffic. So did I freeze up or something? Okay. No restrictions on the traffic. So if this is used for industrial, uh, it would be noisier than what we propose. It would be uh, less attractive than what we propose. In our uh, hosting agreement, we talk about the fact that the textures of the buildings uh, that are near the residences would be done in a manner that uh, has a texture and a feel of softness. Not, it's still a commercial building, but would be more appealing to the eye. We wouldn't have any chain link fence uh, in the front of the building facing the neighbors uh, at all. So we've taken into account a lot of this. And I just wanna point out that this is still a concept. We can't really get to the fine tuning until there's been uh, a walk through the site by a saw scientist. Jim's got the, the uh, ability to do some soil investigation for all sorts of terrain issues. And in planning and zoning where neighbors can show up and talk about their issues and we can react accordingly. At planning and zoning, the real details of what this is gonna look like will come out. It's kind of hard to do at this phase, but the mayor and Janet Small wanted something in there that at least put the bookends. And that's what this hosting agreement initially did. But the details of which, of which is that planning and zoning. So with the hosting agreement, I think from the council perspective, really deals with the economics of the plan. As Janice mentioned, uh, we are talking about values for a 16 megawatt building of about 500,000 a year. From a 16 to just a little less than 32 megawatts, it's a million. And for 32 megawatts and over, it's a million five a year. If you figure out back that to say, what would be the fair market value of the building such that it would yield a million dollars in taxes, I would suggest to you it's like over $40 million. So the value of the tax uh, benefit of the town of Wallingford given this development and this hosting agreement is truly significant because those numbers I mentioned are per building. So it's truly significant impact. Um, and let's, let's be uh, honest uh, about the conversation here. Wallingford is a very attractive town, uh, you know, represented for years. It's a great town to live in. And with its own electricity, it certainly attracts a lot of businesses, particularly in your development, in your industrial park. That all being said, manufacturing is not doing very well in the state of Connecticut. Connecticut is a tough place to do business. 
It is what it is. And therefore, trying to entice manufacturers to go in here uh, is a very tough obligation for the town to achieve. So we bring a different result that is going to be less impactful to the neighbors visually, less impactful to the neighbors uh, through the sound, a more money for the town relative to tax dollars earned. And then there's obviously construction income from using trucks and haulers around the area. There's supplies, restaurants, and all the ancillary. But direct income from this is significant and the impact is minimal. And I also say the traffic impact is minimal relative per square foot of an industrial space. There are not a lot of employees. There's a fair amount, I think, 100 per building. Is that fair to say, uh, Tom? If I could, if with you, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind me asking, Tom, what would Sorry. you say the average number per building? Uh, market standards are about 85 uh, per building, of which 15 to 17 are security. The rest in, industri in an industrial place, you probably have a lot more per square foot for and all sorts of different shifts. So we're going to have a less, less impact relative to the traffic as well. So, Mr. Chairman, I think in front of this committee uh, is this uh, hosting agreement. We're ready to answer questions. I would just like to say that we are concerned over timing. I just want to be clear um, and I want to be honest about it. Uh, as I mentioned, this project has begun in March. We're now into June. Um, there are people who are interested who uh, Tom has been talking to at great lengths for many months uh, who actually want to come visit Wallingford, but there's nothing for them to sink their teeth to. In, in other words, to say, this is going to happen. Uh, the other thing is that there's only so much megawatt left on our grid. There are other towns that have this plan out there and have adopted them, adopted these types of hosting agreements. Not as detailed as this one, uh, but they've adopted hosting agreements. It already started to entice people. And if that grid has a limited amount that we could take, for everyone who signs up in another town, our possibility of getting somebody decreases uh, to the extent that they take that power away. So I think that timing is an issue. There are other uh, contracts out there that need to be cemented uh, in a time fashion. So we, we would ask respectfully uh, for uh, an approval tonight. We would respectfully indicate that we have tried our best to get everything, everything together. It's been a long process and we have uh, given as much as we can to make this possibility for the town of Wallingford. We believe this is a great opportunity for the town of Wallingford. And through you, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I don't know if my client, uh, Mr. Queen, would like to add to what I just said. You may. Thank you. Just like to say thank you for taking all the time. We've been diligently pursuing this contract. We've made a number of concessions. Uh, I uh, am tasked with balancing uh, the requests of the town against the market factors that currently exist across the country, which includes an awful lot of phone calls at every single turn for every single uh, venue, the sound issue alone, which we already had uh, uh, letters uh, uh, meeting all the town standards from manufacturers and so forth we had to then uh, readjust and it took you know days of work back and forth with engineers across the country to get that done to to at least be able to consider that we could get to the number uh, that Wallingford it's a very aggressive number would like us to achieve um, we do need access into this property this is roughly 300 acres it's quite expensive um, we can't really do much more in the development phase. We provided some plans so you could get a general idea, but none of these plans are approved and likely all of these buildings remove in some way, shape or form. I can tell you that if we get a particular hyperscaler in, they're gonna bring their own plan in our JV arrangement and they will be looking at how they, a joint venture arrangement, by the way, uh, so they'll be looking at how they want to uh, build that particular building so that the, the, the size may change from a rectangle to a to an H or to a Y or some other some other letter out there. So um, 
the access is important. I mean, we're going to need to get access to the property. We're going to need a little bit of consideration on the um, on the emergency access and construction ways, especially uh, when they're putting the foundation in, which isn't a long period of time per foundation because it's a continuous pour, but we will need some help uh, during that uh, particular time. Besides that, um, appreciate everything. Uh, we'd like to get the financial part of this deal put together so we can move on to real plans and real planning board and real reports and get the freight engineers to come in and start the process. But thank you very much and uh, appreciate all your time. All right, there are counselors with questions. Uh, first up, Councillor Zandri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. So I, I have a couple of comments that I wanna make um, before I, I ask my questions because I, I wanna follow up on a couple of things that were said and I also want to kind of uh, box in why my questions are going to come the way they're gonna come. So I, I really do appreciate the amount of detail we we did receive. I, I realized some of it came very late in the very late in the game, so to speak. Um, but I know that things were changing by the minute, and you guys were trying to put everything together so that we could have it um, as much as a detailed plan that we could look at. So I, I do appreciate that, um, Mr. Fasano. I'm so used to calling you Senator. I, I was like, I have to say, Mr. Fasano. Um, I, I did want to. I, I did want to just kind of address your your comment. Uh, it was a pretty good comment. I don't know if you actually went back and did the math on uh, the hosting agreement as compared to taxes. You're pretty, you weren't too far off. We, it would need to be a $35 million building in order to generate a million dollars in taxes in Wallingford. And, and therefore, part of what you're discussing here is actually multiple billions of the same facet. So I kind of wanted to preface that because it was a, it was a very good estimate. And I kind of want to set that tone for everybody my fellow counselors, uh, people that are watching at home or, or watching the meeting live. Or the idea here is that this, this, this is a very large sum of money um, for the town to be looking at and, and in the type of building that would really need to be multiple times over to, for the town to bring it in. Having said that as well, I, I want to, I'm gonna start to go into my questions now and I want, I want the gentleman here to understand why there is a level of sensitivity beyond just the uh, economics of the plan, which is really the focus that, you know, maybe kind of sort of the council should be looking at tonight. And, and, I, and I say that because once upon a time, there was um, a commercial entity that was built here in town. People, I'm, I'm sure everybody's familiar with them, Thurston Foods and the Thurston family who've been here forever. They are placed squarely in a commercial area and then developers wanted to start to build up against this commercial area. And they came before us during these, plan, uh, you know, these planning and zoning meetings and, and basically came right out and told the town, you're, you're giving land use, proper land use, because these were residential areas that were backing up against commercial areas. Those people, their rights to build on those properties they knew that they were there was going to be a problem someday. They said, "Listen, we're we're a we're a, a a solid business. We're a growing business, and this will become a problem at some point." And it did. And and that's where my my frame of questioning is going to start to come right now. So I, I appreciate all of the hard work that everyone has done on outlining the the sound concerns. Here is here is the way that I'm looking at all of these sound issues. So I, I'm gonna just be generic first and then kind of dig in. There, there, is a, there is a ordinance level that sets, it's, there's one at the state and we match it at the local level at the, the most noise that an area can have. This, and, and I understand that, that you're not looking to push closer, but I, I wanna preface the idea of sound in general. Wherever somebody hangs their hat, they're used to whatever that neighborhood offers for noise. Now, you know, it might be, I, I grew up down on South Cherry Street. So the noisy trains weren't really noisy trains for me. That was the neighborhood. But the idea is somebody else suddenly um, moving to that area wouldn't be used to something like that. So now this is something entirely different. There, there are homes that are already there and they are used to whatever ambient noise might be around. Some noise from the highway that maybe gets across the ground when there's nice, clean, crisp air. There's nearby traffic, things that are going on at homes and 
I don't know what the measurement might be. If I was just going to spitball the number and say maybe that's an, an, in the area of 35 decibels all the time, it, it might not be acceptable for the people that live in those areas to suddenly have the decibel level increased all the time on an average basis, another five decibels, clearly inside of the limits, but still much noisier than it used to be. Now, I, I can't argue the, the other side of the issue where and a statement was made, I think Mr. Fasano made it. You know, maybe somebody else would come in and build something worse or something louder or something got even closer to the to the sound ordinance level and so on, and we, we'd still be dealing with that. Um, you know, on, on the most extreme side, the town could always purchase the land for open space and keep it that way. I don't suggest that we do that, and I don't believe that's anywhere near what we're going. But I wanna kind of focus down on, on the noise issue and on the neighbors, and I think a lot of work has been done to have, have this, once it's done, meet all these parameters and make sure that we're dealing with all the things correctly. But I, I guess I kind of want to ask, because I, I read the document and I, I kind of want to just get an understanding of what, I, I'm going to start the earlier parts of this too. So during the construction period, I mean, we're at the ultimate, the ultimate point is this, this thing will be built and running and we're going to have to deal with the sound there. But I'm also concerned with, you know, the, the period of time it takes us to build one of these data centers is going to be, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe someone said on the, on the upward side of about 18 months to do this. That was correct on that. Okay. So if we're not doing all of them at once, we, we may be doing them in stages. So construction, I mean, hypothetically could be going on for six years across four buildings or, you know, two buildings at a time, maybe it's three years and the sound will be in different areas because of different construction zones. But this would be ongoing for a long period of time, and it's a different type of sound than a running facility. So I'd like to start my question with, during a construction phase, wherever it might be on whichever property, what are we looking at as far as um, not disturbing more of the, I don't call it normal sound or normal decibel levels of sound that exist today while the construction is going on? Can, can you help me understand that a little bit better? Sure, I can help you do that. You're going to hear construction just like you did with the Amazon building in North Haven and all of the other large buildings that have been built. It's about five months or roughly of uh, site work. It is about five to six months of foundation and conduit and raised floor work to get the foundation in. And then the balance is the tilt up concrete walls that come there. They fit up the glass and that stuff out in the front of the building toward the end of the process. So there will be noise, there'll be excavation noise. But I think if you draw your attention to the map that was shown, um, there's one or two uh, buildings that would, uh, and they may or may not be built together as one. We don't know that yet. They could be uh, divided up and there could be a third there. But uh, those buildings, uh, that are closest to Tankwood uh, would probably um, be the most intrusive for sound for construction. However, the ones that are in the back and the ones that are more central in the project, um, they're thousands of feet to the backside and uh, at least a thousand or fifteen hundred feet. I don't have the measurement in front of me. Jim can give it to us. So uh, I would say that would be really minimal impact. I sat out on North Farms Road in my car and I counted many tractor trailer trucks going by and cars and dump trucks and so forth. So it is being used for industry now. So it's important to note that those trips won't any longer exist because we'll have the <clears> property <throat> that those that's gen that are generating those traffic trips now and yes, there will be a period of time for noise to be able to build these, and then it will be very quiet. In fact, the people that I'm talking to consider what Wallingford proposed is probably the most aggressive noise uh, ordinance, if it, we call it that now, or requirement in the country, in the country. And I just want to make a, a point. There are data centers in downtown um, cities across the world. So it is, uh, they do exist, 
near residential areas. They do exist in cities. They do exist in high rise form. They do exist single story. They do exist in the desert. Uh, so they're really, you know, all types of different variations. Um, uh, the noise piece is important. Uh, there was um, uh, quite a bit of time spent on, on this, but it will be very quiet once these are fully built operational landscaping in. And I just want to mention the last thing on the traffic. Uh, if we were to fully entitle all of the buildings, there would be approximately, and we can't tell now until we know the size and who's coming, but it'd be approximately 500 jobs, but over three shifts. So the, the traffic, the eventual traffic on any of these roads, including North Farms or Tankwood, although we've agreed not to use them, is going to be a very small amount of cars at, over an eight hour period. So I just, if I can, first of all, I'm embarrassed to say I actually did do the math, but I'm not good at math. So uh, thank you for that correction. Uh, and I came out with 45, I figured I lowered it to 40 just in case. So, uh, but the other thing is on the sound, you're absolutely right. Not about the construction, I think Tom covered, but let me talk about the operation. So what we're gonna do is what we agreed to and what the sound expert of Wallingford asked for was take the sound over 24 hour period, the ambient, what's going on right now. So what are neighbors hearing and use that as the baseline. And then they would model out the building, the whatever the heck they do on the computers to model it out. And we'd have to be, there's a variant in there. We'd have to be within that variant. But once again, the town gets to review it and determine whether or not we meet that standard. And it's gonna be different for those who are closer to 91 versus those who are closer to maybe something a little less uh, noisy. So we do take that into account on an individual basis. Once again, that would not be true as you pointed out if it was all industrial. So we're not going to the ordinance of industrial, we're going to what's there now, we're making it up and creating what your existing life is now. We have to adopt to it as opposed to it being industrial, they would have to adopt to the industrial sound. That's a huge difference for those who live around this area. All right, so on, on that, I, I think this is the section that I was reading. So when you're with, with the, the sound measurements that are there, based on what I hear today, there's a continuous sound of 10 decibels. I'm gonna make the assumption that the, the uh, I don't want to call it a variance, but the, the the buffer, if you will, is that we're we're suggesting that if the current sound level is 30 decibels, that continuous sound could from the site could add to 10, but not exceed that. Is that the way I should read that? So um, you know what I'm gonna I want to make sure uh, Attorney Small, I am correct in uh, if I go wrong or go astray, please reel me back in. But yes, it, I actually asked for a variant to be put on. So let's just say it's 10 decibels, whatever the heck that measurement is at somebody's yard. And we would be within, we have a variant of five, so we'd be at 15. And uh, Attorney Small and the mayor said, no, uh, that, that variant is built into the formula. So we would be as close to that existing sound as been measured over a 24 hour period. The way it is measured is going to be dicta is going to be between the our sound consultant, the town sound consultant, coming up with the best practice standard, and once they determine what that is, given different sites or their areas, we would abide by that standard, give them the report, come up with a design that the town would then sign off. Is that through uh, Mr. Chairman through you to Janice Small? Is that your understanding as well as what this agreement says? Yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. I, there is a um, a week long measurement too. So it's yeah, it's it's defining what is out there now and a determination as to what additional noise would be acceptable to residential uses being that close, and um, then the buildings would have to be designed to meet that limit um, so I think I think that's correct 
Yeah, and and I, that's I wanted to kind of confirm what I read. And and you are correct. It says measured in hourly increments for one week. That's 168 hours continuously measured at at one or more locations on each parcel. And then it outlines that the background sound level is the average of the lowest occurring each 24 hour day. And then mm -hmm. there's there's a there's the the variant part, which is the acceptable amounts that the facility might exceed the existing mm -hmm. level today. And that's where I had the continuous sound at 10 decibels. And I make the assumption of that being more than what we hear today based on all of those readings outlined that I just read out. You know, just keep in mind, a 10, a 10 decibel increase is a doubling of the sound. These are, these are real numbers, it's a real concern. And that is why, you know, we view that the um, noise ordinance would not be sufficient to deal with this with the being this close to residential and that's why this protocol was established. Right and that's thank you thank you for that Janice because it's very that's very important for people to understand because if right now it's it's 30 and the the variance allows them maybe to go up to 40 people feel like well we, you know we restrict them a lot but that's double you know that's double like like Janice Small just said and Per permissively, we could go all the way to um, 55 during the day and 45 at night, and that's that's a heck of a lot more. So I want people to have a good understanding of that. Um, and and again, you know, I I I'm gonna I I might have more questions. But I got a feeling some of the other counselors may ask these as well. So I'm gonna kind of let it go. But I I want I want the gentleman to understand that you know I'll speak for myself. I'm supportive of this because I believe this is a best use case scenario that I can think of. I mean, and then maybe, you know, there's there's better ways that I haven't thought of to to do the mix of everything that we're looking to do here. We're bringing in some technology. We're going to get, we're going to get use on this property, which has been very hard pressed to develop prior and getting the type of tax revenue out of a deal that, you know, we're potentially going to get by the way that this agreement is set up. But, but myself and other counselors ha are very sensitive to these these issues that do sound a lot like planning and zoning type things because when 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 problems have occurred they do come to us we discussed the issue between the the residents that were nearby Thurston's and Thurston's themselves at council that's that's how bad it got now it was referred back and this went back and forth they came down to the ordinance and that's why it came back to us so we want to make sure that going into a, an approval of something like this is going to meet the as much of the acceptance of everyone, the 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 town, uh, you know, uh, the workers, the people, the residents that live nearby, you folks that are engaged in this. We've got to all meet in the middle. And I and I would like to say I believe you guys have come a very long way to get to the middle. And I, I still want to hear what some of the other counselors have for questions, as as well as bringing in the concerns that the neighbors are going to have. But uh, but I I do want to appreciate, um, I, I do want to say that I appreciate the time and effort that's been put into this and the opportunity to ask my questions here tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Testa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for your. Uh, for being here and answering our questions. My, as I think about this, I, I, I realize we, as much as this has been presented correctly as a primarily a financial agreement at this stage, we find ourselves dabbling in areas where we normally don't, and that is planning and zoning type things. We don't talk about any of those. Things. We don't talk about sound, traffic. We just don't do that. So we're kind of out of our out of our our area here. And it's tempting to say uh, the concept is attractive because it is. I I I like the concept. And then to say um, we can approve this because down the road, other authorities are going to uh, enact the controls necessary to make this acceptable to the community. 
that's what planning and zoning does. Yet, within our agreement that we're talking about, we're talking about things that we would normally expect somebody else to manage. And the sound is primarily what we're talking about. So I, you know, I, 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 I want to be very careful about this. I don't want us to agree to something that someone else may then say, no, you already agreed to this. And then, and I want to be careful about that. But we're not waiving our, uh, the rights of the Planning and Zoning Commission and the Inland Wetlands and Water Courses to review the, the projects, the building department. Oh, of course not. No, I'm just talking about when it comes to sound. That's not part of the equation in planning and zoning and building. Right, but if it's in our agreement, did, did, did they then have the ability to raise the questions? I don't see why not. Okay, cool. Um, that's fine. Uh, I will say, I, 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 I'm in, in, in principle, I, I think this is a uh, very attractive opportunity for the community. I myself, I have an environmental science background. I was in that field for a long time. I was a wetlands commissioner. I, I look at so many things when I consider development opportunities. And I, from the beginning, I've, I've said, I don't see anything about this uh, type of development that is a, a concern to me at all, other than the potential negative impact to residential areas nearby from a quality of life standpoint. And that's an important consideration. I'm, I'm comfortable that there are not uh, the typical traffic concerns, environmental concerns, runoff concerns, those types of things, uh, uh, while they are uh, present in any development, they seem to me far more uh, manageable and favorable in this type of development and in so many other possibilities in what let's agree is an industrial zone. So I'm, I'm all over that. Um, and I say to myself, well, I was gonna ask the question, first of all, what's the urgency that this be agreed to this evening? Um, Attorney Small mentioned that there are opportunities, well, there, that there are, um, parts of this agreement that need to be, let's see if I put it this way, but need to be tweaked, that are still open for discussion. Yet, if we approve it, how is that tweaking done? And, um, and then I guess that just leads me to the question that I keep coming back to, what are we really agreeing to tonight specifically? So, and for me to approve this, I'm gonna to have to be comfortable with that. So as the discussions go on, make sure this is answered. What are we agreeing to? It appears to me it's going to be financial primarily and the inclusion of some um, restrictions about sound levels, along with a lot of conditions about um, restricting additional properties and so forth and so on. I understand all that. But what are we really agreeing to? What is still, what still needs to be handled down the road? All the other questions that come up with a normal development, because we don't approve developments as a body. That's not what we normally do. We're kind of out of our wheelhouse with this. Um, am I correct in the estimate that for example, the North Farms, the map that's in front of us, or has was in front of us, that that development alone uh, would potentially generate three and a half million dollars with the buildings that are put on there. Was that a correct read? Tom, can you answer that one? Um, we believe that that the maximum number of buildings, based on the utility that may or may not be available, will be to be between maximum now would be five to six, but we really believe that we'll cap at four to four and a half, and there would be a half in there. So that on that one site, that would generate about $6 million a year 
we haven't talked about this, but all of our contracts in other towns include final mile pricing for the electric. The electric benefit to the town, the actual profit for the final mile is actually more than the host fee agreement, the way this works. So there's another layer here no one's discussed, but it's a big win, with no expense against it, or the no obvious expense against it. In other words, no sticks and wires increases or expenses whatsoever for the electric company. So uh, it, it far exceeds $6 million a year on that one site. You're on mute. I'm sorry. Councillor Testa, you're you're muted. You wish. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to get to the electric actually, but but I, I just wanted that out there that as we look at one parcel, large parcel, albeit there's four or five buildings on there that could easily generate. I I, I just estimated three and a half because three of them were 16 and two of them were 32, but as you suggested, they could be more, um, and that's one parcel. Uh, so it's safe to say that we are looking at potential revenues to the town that by any measure, any metric, uh, would exceed tax revenues from comparable or possible industrial developments. So that's a good thing. We're all happy about that. Um, I, when we're talking about the noise levels, I'm reading three different, three different documents. Um, but I think the last discussion sort of helped me out a little bit. Is it, am I understanding this correctly that the, the agreement would be such that current background noise levels would be used as a baseline and we would you would not be exceeding them by the the 5 15 10 that was in the sound engineer's report is that correct that's correct okay that's well I could, I'm not entirely so the okay. whole point of setting so you, you get the baseline data and from that the experts determine what would be an acceptable level to add to that for purposes of these centers then uh -huh. they would have to design the features of their data centers to make sure that they are in compliance with what that limit is set that's how that would work and I did want to say, if I could go back to you, you would raise the question about, you know, what are we here to do? So they can't come here tax free without this agreement. So in order to come under the state program, they have to have an agreement with, with the host town. So that's, that's why they, that's what you're really here to do. That's why the town can say this is these are the terms upon which you can come to Wallingford. And um, then they need that agreement in order to move their whole development forward. They need that to convince um, you know, tenants, for lack of a better word, or occupants of the data centers to come to Wallingford. They need to have know that they have the financial, primarily the financial, but the agreement in place that the town of Wallingford said, yes, you can come here under the state statute that allows you to be otherwise tax exempt. That's that's the that's why they need this document to be resolved um, sooner rather than later. I Thank think you. I said that. No, I understand. Yes. Yeah, exactly. What Attorney Small said, it, to your other point, after, if and when you approve this agreement, then you, we still have to do the whole development side of this going through planning and zoning and inland wetlands who have their jurisdictions of this. So it isn't like if you approve this, a shovel goes in the ground, there's a whole nother process we still have to comply with. That and the utility term sheets right. next. Right, and I, and I fully understand that. Um, I, I just, I wanted to, I didn't want to make sure that nothing we agree to, you know, at this early stage after a relatively short amount of time, 
from our perspective and public discussion perspective, um, sets any type of standards that um, restrict our planning and zoning commission from applying their guidelines. And that's why like that. so we see sound mentioned. I just want to make sure that you know we're we're not we're not setting standards in this in this agreement tonight. If we approved it, that um, uh, cannot be managed by our planning people down the road. So I'm I'm okay so far. Um, I noticed, and I think this was answered. We uh, our agreement is set up right now that uh, no additional properties could be added without uh, discussion and approval by the town. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Uh, however, uh, the amount of development on each property is not being established. You're giving us examples, but that is uh, an example. That's correct. Right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, This may seem strange. Does anyone have a, can anyone give me an example? And it may not even be reasonable. What is 10 decibels? If I could ask the engineer, because I think he may have a grid, uh, perhaps that just to give an example, Jim, do you have something available or you can read off of? Yes. Yeah. So, <clears throat> 10 decibels. Excuse right, so. me, Jim. Just so we know, Jim is the civil engineer. He's not the sound engineer. Okay. Understood. Thank you. So, so we have to be careful about using numbers like 10 decibels uh, because, uh, for example, a, a busy residential road will has a range, but it, it will fall around 80 decibels for a busy residential road. So as uh, attorney Small indicated, when we increase that by 10 decibels, we're not truly, well, it depends on where you are, but 10 decibels is a logarithmic increase in the amount of sound. So there's a, there's a long math formula that talks about what 10 decibels is. But let me give you a reference, just so you, you understand what that soundscape number which is really what you're discussing in the in that week long study is what's the ambient soundscape of a given site. So 30 decibels is a recording studio, meaning there's no there's no reflected sound at that at that point. It's a very flat noise. So 30 is very quiet in terms of a of an amb ambient soundscape. Normal human conversation, not raised voices, is about 60 decibels. So you're you're quadruple what a what a recording studio ambient sound is just in communication. So for each one of those numbers, you're going up a logarithmic scale. It's not a it's not an additive thing where you, you can't say I got 10 and then I add 10 more and now I have 20. That's that's not exactly how the sound scale works. So I hope that answers your question. I, I yes, thank you very much. And I know I'm really I'm almost as, asking questions that are almost absurd. But we we talk about this, and I'm I'm not a stupid person, but I'm you know I I I don't know how many people could actually know what the heck they're talking about when we talk about sound. And I'm I'm sitting in my backyard, and my neighbor's mowing the lawn. What is that? Because this is what we're talking about. We're talking about neighbors that are going to be on their patio enjoying their lives. And 300 feet away, there's going to be something happening. And is that going to be a hum? Is it going to be a buzz? Is it going to be a rumble? That, that's what we're talking about. And, and, and I'm trying to wrap my head around that because that's what we're really deciding on. We could put, we don't know what we're talking about. When we say numbers. So I'm trying to put it into perspective. If you said to me, you know, a couple hours a night, it's going to sound like someone's using a chainsaw. I'm going to say, yeah, that's no good. I don't like that. That's not acceptable. 
if you said to me, there might be a light hum that you could, you really couldn't hear unless you really tried, then now we're talking about something that we can then talk to the neighbors and say, is this reasonable? So that's where my head is at on this one. And when we talk about decibel levels, it's out of, it's out of you know, I, I don't know what the heck we're talking about. So as we go forward, that's what I'm saying. What are, what are the neighbors gonna hear? We talked about a generator running and I'm been the understanding that these things are gonna be enclosed. There might be a slight hum, there might be a slight buzz. I don't know what it's going to be, but if it sounded like, you know, the data center was mowing their lawn for seven hours at eight o'clock in the evening when someone's trying to have a picnic, now we're talking about reality to people, and these are the kind of so, things we I think we should understand. So, I'm, so I'd I'm like going, to, I'd like to address a couple of those to take some I'm, of the anxiety out of it. Thank you so much because that's what I'd like to hear. Okay, so so the generators are in containers that are baffled containers. They're going to sit on the opposite side away from the quietest, the quietest side, or, or, or you know, to keep them away from any homes, that makes a difference. The generators are contained in a half-inch steel. I've given all the specs to the town. They are going to be tier four generators, the best on the market. As you walk, you know, you you go to these different towns, even while I've heard you see peaking engines and so forth. These are in boxes. These are in basically trailers. That's what they are, and they just sit there in a steel trailer, and they have their own little system, and they run and the venting goes up through the building, goes to the parapet wall. On top of the parapet wall are the air conditioners. Now, we can't tell you today, because this is about the financial part of this deal, if the parapet wall is gonna be so many feet or not. We're not even sure which air conditioners, because each company uses different, some the same, but many different air conditioning systems on the roofs and so forth, and those, will be sound engineered. So let's say we're 300 feet away and that's the most aggressive place we are. Everything is further. And we may be able to move those buildings even further away from the 300 feet. We just haven't gotten to that yet because we've spent an awful lot of money and we haven't gotten past this hosting fee agreement yet. So if we do that, we'll be able to start bringing in drafts to the planning board. We move the building away from that location, the sound engineer for the town, the sound engineer that we have, they get together and they begin to do studies based on that flag and that location, they start to figure out what the noise is going to be. Now, it may be that we can't meet the sound ordinance there. We may have to take that building and move it another 200 feet if it's possible, or we may lose part of a site, or we may have to bring them back to the back corner, change the shape of the building, all of these things can happen. But right now, what we have is the most aggressive noise ordinance. New Jersey would be second. We're told by the largest data company in the world, head of sustainability, that that's the most aggressive noise <laughs> ordinance they've ever seen. I'm not laughing about it. I'm just telling you, here we are. And I will also tell you that the air conditioners, just like your own condensers at home for your air conditioning, have gotten quieter and quieter over the years. And now they're getting extremely efficient. You'll, we won't have any problems with the generator to meet any any sound because we can baffle those down. It's just a it's just a question of how much baffling one through four levels, and uh, and they're used. Uh, these same generators are used in different parts of very sensitive areas that are near residential, especially areas in New Jersey. And um, and I use New Jersey not only because it's close by, but it's it's aggressive in in its noise control. So without getting any further into the weeds, these are all things that we're going to need to test once we get final building locations. Then we're going to have to hold with planning board for a minute or two, and we're going to have to get the sound work done, get them to agree on the sound work, or then we're going to have to move the building. So we're agreeing to a very aggressive set of circumstances in Wallingford on and some very difficult access issues to make this as comfortable as we can for everybody that's involved. Um, but two things are going to be necessary. There will be some sound generated. It'll be probably the ambient road noise in most of the day, especially on the 91 side, will be greater than what the generators produce, probably by some great number, right? a greater number than we expect. And the other thing is we need access. So if you can work with us on those two things, we would be happy to bring in multiple uh, you know, uh, 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 choices for building locations and 
We do have interested parties, I will tell you. I am working constantly on it. They would like to come to Wallingford as soon as we get a host agreement done. And so I can get the last piece in. We're also going to need to get our utility agreement done immediately after the hosting agreement. Those are the necessary documents to be able to entice someone to come. Lastly, there is not a line of people with deli tickets in their hand waiting to come to any town in Connecticut. I have spent the last two years of my life trying to convince people that if Connecticut set the table properly, that they should, should consider coming. And even now with some of the companies, uh, everyone's waiting for the first one. And I think we have a first one uh, because they want someone else to break the ice. You know, everyone wants to be on the, on the sled ride. Uh, no one wants to sit in the front of it, right? So, uh, um, you know, we're really ready to go. I'll tell you, we have contracts out. We have interested parties. It's important that we wrap it up as soon as we possibly can. We'd appreciate a, a vote unless you need to move it to uh, a fairly, uh, you know, close date coming up because I know there's a few small adjustments that you want done, but I would appreciate doing, we put an awful lot of time, money, effort uh, from the original legislative piece down to each of the individual towns. So um, if I can answer anything else on the sound, let me know and appreciate your time. Oh, uh, thank you. That would, that would, I appreciate that. Uh, I just want to clear. I, 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 I simply want to make sure that we're, we're, uh, we're taking into account um, the effect on the neighbors, uh, keeping it really simple. All the other details, uh, I've read everything, and I, I find it, um, I find it attractive. I'm just bringing up, you know, the one thing that we've talked about from the beginning, and I have a better understanding, and uh, is, I want to be comfortable that it's going to be taken care of. And uh, and I I guess I I've, I've talked enough. So thank you very much. Thank hey, you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate you. appreciate your comments. Yes, sir. Councilor Testa, I just want to clarify um, something that I might have clouded when you and I were discussing the need for approvals. Um, one of the things that led to the Thurston problem is that the noise was not a factor in the zoning application or at the time that the residences were being proposed next to Thurston, that wasn't addressed as part of that application. So really the, the opportunity to address noise is now, you know, this host agreement gives us the opportunity to do it and we should. Great, thank you. Yep. Next up, uh, Councillor Marone. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So I guess, I'm, you know, I'm going to start with why are we even talking about this, right? So uh, obviously there's a development opportunity uh, for someone to make money in town. We've all agreed, uh, and Mr. Fasano started his comments out noting that how difficult it is to do business in Connecticut, the economics aren't there, right? So the free market would not bring a development like this to Wallingford were it not for uh, the state stepping in and changing the arrangement so that the, the town takes a break on the taxes to get this development in the state, right? Because this is an area the state wants to develop. In a lot of ways, this reminds me of the Bristol Myers situation, where the town, you know, however many years ago, uh, wanted to attract Bristol Myers to town, so we offered a tax break. Uh, we made all kinds of arrangements for electrical and access and so on and so forth. Bristol Myers was here. Um, they, you know, it's a big business. Things change in business. They left, and now we have this big white elephant sitting on one side of town. So, I like the idea. You know, I'm fascinated by the the whole concept of bringing a data center to this part of the country. Um, I guess I have concerns that you have someone that's not really invested in town or from the area, you know, that's, uh, um, I, I guess I'd like to do a longitudinal study on Bristol Myers and see if it was that good for Wallingford or bad for Wallingford at the end of the day. So, you know, you bring another large operator in here, who's to say that in 10 years, they decide it's not profitable to be here. We already know we have an electrical issue uh, in this state, right? We don't have enough uh, power capacity for the, for the residents and so on. So, you know, if this was to become popular and you were to put these all over the state, you know, at what point do you run out of power? Or, or does it become a you know a bigger strain in the grid, which is then going to cost cost all the ratepayers money? So I guess my biggest concern though is uh, we've heard from you know I know the EDC is the one that made the deal. Um, this wouldn't get in front of the council without the approval of the, the administration. But I haven't heard anything from the mayor's office in terms of do they think this is a good a good idea or the direction we should be moving in or don't they? So I guess that's my first question. I guess that's directed to me. 
Yes, please, sir. <laughs> uh, well, we wouldn't be spending the time that we have on this uh, without uh, a belief that there is value here for the community. Um, obviously, it represents change, and we try to address that change in, in, in the way of change that brings uh, discomfort, challenges to the quality of life, et cetera, uh, means of addressing that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's major development. There's no question about it, but it doesn't carry with it a lot of the traffic uh, and other issues that many other large developments would typically bring. Uh, whether it's retail or manufacturing, they certainly can bring far more uh, daily activity with congestion and other other challenges that this does not represent. This is unique in that it, it deals with electric power and it deals with some uh, major, major issues for not only the town, but also our, our electric division. It wouldn't be here except that we think it is well worth considering. There are some fine points, I believe. I think Janice expressed that accurately, and I believe Jerry Farrell, town attorney, is on the line too. There are some uh, issues that still have to be dealt with. Uh, one thing that should be considered, it's unlikely that all of these buildings will be built at one time. So what would be the reaction to uh, having no more than three or so in a three-year period? We get some sense of what the total would look like, and that should give some some reassurance to people that it's not going to. In, in 18 months, we have seven or eight big buildings going up with no real experience on. So we're we're on the administrative side. We're, this appears to be something that is beneficial to the town. We want to handle it in a manner that is is cautious is is uh, thoughtful and certainly the noise issue is a major one and maybe another issue might be how much should it all be undertaken within a certain time period and maybe uh, maybe uh, attorney Fasano can speak to that or, or mr. Quinn uh, is is that an acceptable portion of this agreement that there'd be no more than three of the buildings in a three-year period or something like that. I'd like to answer that uh, if I could. So to understand the answer that I'm going to give you, you need some gauge and the gauge works like this. Um, Google, Facebook, Microsoft are not building 32 megawatt buildings anymore. The large co-locations are still building 32 to 48. So if a simple deal was struck with one of those that I mentioned and another couple, in fact, we have a customer at that size right now. If that works out, that's the equivalent of three buildings under one roof. That would mean that we would have to close on and have all of this land, all this permitting in process, many tens of millions of dollars and not be able to develop the land. So that certainly wouldn't work for our business plan. Um, we, there is, uh, you know, there, there is going to be a staggered, uh, uh, th these aren't gonna all be built at the same time. They couldn't all be built at the same time. There will be a large infrastructure upgrade in other words, on the large campus that you saw tonight, a substation much larger than needed so that we could expand into the, you know, into future buildings. So that would be built out with the first building. But we have no idea the shape, the size yet, the exact specifications for the buildings yet. And it's going to, we need the flexibility to be able to accept a customer at that high level. And we believe we'll get one or two um, of those, and we're talking to them now. Uh, and many uh, other smaller, and they're not small. These are all quite, you know, 30, 50 data center operators and so forth. Um, but uh, 
we need the flexibility to be able to look at each of these. Now, if there's a problem and the planning board said, wait a minute here, you know, we want this building built on this access and this on this access so we don't have any traffic problems. I've been building things for over 30 years and Len's got expert zoning experience for uh, longer than that. And uh, we'd be happy to work with the town on all of those issues, uh, however they come up. But we do need some flexibility on these sites um, based on uh, on the business plan. Uh, we're going to find that we're going to find that a company might want to take the equivalent of the three sites that we show on another campus and maybe combine them all into one, or they may want the whole site and eliminate one. We don't know that yet. Um, so that's I, I had a couple more answers for Joe, but I'll let that go. And thank you, Mayor. And if I I just wanted to say a couple of things on the Bristol Myers. Bristol Myers left because of two reasons. There was a tax policy change, which was not beneficial to their business. And there was an employment policy change that was not beneficial to their business. And that's why they ended up starting to pull out of Bristol Myers and leave the state of Connecticut. Those are the two compelling reasons why they left. This case, why are data centers looking at Basra and help me out, uh, New London area. Uh, Bristol, uh, Groton, right? They're all municipal run electric companies. That is what is enticing this deal to work. That's, you own the flavor or the ingredients to make it work. The state is locked into the deal. They're now out of it. So you own, the, you own that response. You have the ability to make it happen because the two ingredients are great town and a industrial park that has its own municipal electric company is why they're here. And to the credit of the administration, uh, and you know Tom uh, met with them, but to the credit of David Lehman and others, they saw this opportunity in the West and said this could happen in the East, but only in limited areas. And we're just happy fortunate here in Wallingford. David Lehman's been a great help, but we created the initial draft our company did and brought that to them and uh, worked through the process with EDC for a very long time. We studied every law in the United States. We tried to find out how to be competitive. Uh, we created the hosting agreement. Our team created the hosting agreement um, and, uh, and pulled it together uh, and balanced the uh, profit to municipal electricity plus hosting agreement equals where we would need to be on national market basis. A couple things about electricity you need to know. And I'm sure the mayor and the electric co company that's on tonight knows it already. But um, there is plenty of electricity in the New England grid. The fact that we buy electricity brings rates down. It does not bring rates up because there's no additional primary utility being generated. Within the New England grid, there is leftover utility. At every single sale, there's been leftover utility for the last few years. We're just buying up what's left over. And the reason we need these tax incentives is because we're competing against Texas with three and a half cent power and a 20 year fixed price on three and a half cent power, but their tax incentives aren't as good. So it's a simple balancing act. So there's all kinds of spreadsheets and formulas and so forth. So what we've done is we've tried to find that Delta in such a way that we can explain Connecticut where people do not want to be, please pick up the phone, call industry folk. They, Connecticut's, you know, got the X because of regulation, taxes, and cost of utility. So we figured out a way with the municipals, if they cooperate, they can make a profit and we can. There would be a big profit to the municipals. They're not coming out of pocket. There's plenty of utility in the grid available, but there will be a finite number of buildings in New England. There is no question about that. And I'm not the one to tell you that number but we have a good idea of what that number would be. And once they're built and we believe, and we believed in the Connecticut data corridor, we believe they're gonna be in Connecticut because of the fast fiber. You're, you're boxed out in some of the other Northern states, but Connecticut's got 95, which is main trunk fiber, 91, which is main trunk fiber, and they have the municipal utilities. So I saw an opportunity to kind of pull all the pieces together, get into the national market, and make this thing work. I think Wallingford's gonna do very well with this. I think we'll see 
Uh, there are you know 20 some odd hyperscalers these days, not just the big five. I think you're going to see a couple of hyperscalers. I think you're going to see a couple of uh, large scale uh, co-location companies. Um, they're not all going to come on the same day and they're not going to build out fully. That's why if you read the legislation or had time to look at it carefully, you'll see that you can expand. Uh, th there's all kinds of these things that are all pre-designed so that we could start with the 32 meg and make it a 64 over time. These things are carefully thought through. And in the, in the, uh, in the language uh, for your municipal host fee agreement, um, we have addressed these road issues, noise issues, and so forth. I think there is a, an adjustment to be made uh, for exclusion on some ro additional road uh, discussion, but just a couple of lines. But this agreement has uh, been heavily forged over the last uh, couple months. Um, so uh, I hope you, uh, if you have any questions, of course, I'm available to answer them. Uh, but there is, we do have lots of power. In the yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Quinn. You know, you brought up the uh, analogy before the sleigh ride and not companies not wanting to be the first one to get on the sleigh. I feel the same way about our town and this project. You know, not. I think, you know, um, Certainly, I, I respect the way you brought this to us, um, but I just have concerns with, you know, this being the first person to dip in the pool on this type of project in New England. Um, well, I, I don't think, I'm so I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, please, please go ahead. I don't, I don't know if you'll be the first. Um, you might be the second, possibly the third, but maybe the second uh, based on what we're doing. That's why I'm trying to get this hosting agreement signed. Um, I believe we're going to have these data centers and I'm very certain of it, in each of the municipal utility towns. And I believe we'll have at least one or two in each of these towns within three years built. That's what I think based on, and I've traveled the, you know, traveled the country and I'm on calls to the West Coast every day, to overseas every day. And uh, I believe we're gonna see this, and I'll tell you why. We're between New York and Boston. There are eyeballs here. They need the latency future of uh, AI, future of driverless cars, access and edge base, all of those things are important in Connecticut. So we will see some companies come to Connecticut and we will see it fairly quickly. So on the um, on the timing issue, and I, I completely respect that you need to, you know, I mean, you have a business to run, right? So you need to get this moving forward, uh, which I understand, but, you know, by way of example, so we had, you know, we've been talking about our community pool since the fall of 2017, and we haven't been able to do anything with that. Um, the the littering ordinance we talked about earlier, I believe, started in August or September of last year, uh, and that was just a minor change to the ordinance. So this is sort of a major project for us to consider in such a compressed amount of time. I understand that you've been working with uh, uh, the administration, but you know, from the council's perspective, this has been like three weeks. So this has been a whirlwind. We've never moved this fast on anything in town before. This is like the rickety rabbit. Uh, approach. So uh, that just gives me pause. I guess my other question is to, to Janice Small, and that is, um, so if we approve the host agreement tonight, what would be our next opportunity, or when would this come before us again, if at all? Um, it wouldn't need to come, it wouldn't need to come back to the council. The next step would be that there would have to be the enactment of a zoning regulation to permit the use. Okay, thank you very much. I'm all set, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Mayor, uh, just a clarification on that. There would there would have to be a power agreement um, that I think sorry, would come I, to the council. I, I'm sorry, I did forget the power agreement. I'm sorry. Well, don't don't be sorry about it. I don't know how anybody could forget the power agreement. Goodness gracious. <laughs> Not Mr. Quinn. Um, all right. Uh, well, next up is Councilor Laffin. I do see that Mr. Ryan wants to speak. Tim, are you still out there? I am, yes. Go ahead. Okay, so a um, couple of comments. First, I, I want to I thank Mr. Quinn uh, for bringing the opportunity to the town of Wallingford. Um, you know, some time references were made earlier that uh, you know, this, this has become a fast track since, uh, you know, for several months, but um, truth be told, the site selection process on this started in August of 2019. So coming up on two years ago, I was working with this site selection team on identifying potential properties for the projects. 
So um, this is not, uh, you know, certainly all that new. Now it's it's rubber meet the road time. Um, the Economic Development Commission last night did vote uh, via motion uh, and, and, and acknowledges the fact that data center development in the town of Wallingford um, can be, and they believe to be beneficial. Um, and they also uh, voted not to support them um, in their entirety because scale is a concern, but certainly to take and support the ongoing uh, due diligence being uh, done by the, the town administration, notably the mayor um, and uh, uh, Janice Small. So I just I just want to add a couple of things in terms of scale. There was a slide that was up earlier showing the properties ordered by our industrial parks, uh, Sterling Drive, Fairfield Boulevard, Tower Drive, um, North Farms Road, and Tankwood Road. Um, Mr. Quinn has said he needs flexibility. I certainly understand that. Most business people do need flexibility. Flexibility to him is leads to unknowns for us, and that becomes a little bit uncomfortable to Councilor Marone's uh, point. Um, for example, the, the initial drawings for that, that particular, uh, those parcels um, had fewer buildings on them. Uh, the first the first time I saw the one that was presented tonight, now I'm seeing five buildings where before there were fewer. So um, I, I would just, I also want to add that um, Councilor Testa brought up a great point. It says the number of properties can't be expanded without permission from the town. But what's the baseline of properties that are being you know accepted? You have in your packets a delineation of those properties, those sites. There was over 500 acres of property on those sites being proposed. So if that is the baseline and says that you know we can't, um, they can't expand anything beyond what we what you approve, and you're approving the possibility of data centers going on 500 acres of property, that is from um, pretty much from Route 15 east all the way to 91, and then behind the Hilton Garden Inn goes across 91. That's a big swath of property that in essence is almost every acre of developable property in that area. That doesn't make it a bad thing necessarily. All I'm saying is that scale is, is to me, is, is a concern. And it's something that we should be well aware of. All right, how big is too big? How much is enough? Um, I think it's been mentioned a couple of times earlier that you know the mayor had mentioned, geez, can we can we kind of test drive a couple of buildings? Let's see what these things look like, feel like. Can we experience them? I can understand Mr. Quinn saying, hey, it could be a 32 megawatt building, could be a 16, could be a combination thereof. Another thing in terms of scale, four 32 megawatt buildings, four of them, double the output of the Wallingford Electric Division. All right, I share that. Not to scare anybody, just to say that's the type of scale we're talking about. These are this is a big, big project. So I, I will leave it at that. That um, um, do I think data centers could benefit us economically? Absolutely do. Uh, do I think the, some of the properties that they've they've optioned are great locations for data centers? Absolutely do. Um, do I think we should develop 500 acres of data center? I, I don't know the answer to that because we haven't experienced any. I will tell you that in my research, I've called Edison, New Jersey, Somerset, New Jersey, Piscataway, New Jersey. I've talked to my economic development counterparts in all those communities. Um, they, you know, sound is not necessarily an issue in those areas because there's there's no um, uh, there's no the back, the background noise concept. I forget what you guys call it, but residual noise. But um, I, I just I will leave it at that. I just want to say scale. Is is a is a concern from um, our from our perspective of the EDC. I'd like to respond if I could. Sure. When we first discussed this with David Lehman at EDC, this was designed around a hyperscale data build. There are other small data centers around that can go on multiple acre process. These sites are the size they are because the national market dictates it. For example, in Tennessee right now, with Tennessee Valley Authority 
services, there are two Facebook centers on 120 acres. Okay, they would like to have more, but that's all they could get. If you go to DeKalb, Illinois, is where you see a Facebook center. These campuses are typically 80 to 100 to 120 acres. Why? They want the privacy, they want the security, and they may need room for expansion, but that would be a planning board discretion at some point in the future. And when I say in the future, if you're building a million square feet, it's not gonna be for some time. Uh, Mr. Marone brought up a couple of points uh, related to the utility, and I keep hearing this about the utility. The utility company is not gonna have to work overtime. When we bring in the team, from the company that we're partnering with, that team brings in their engineers. Those engineers fill out all the paper, do all the studies, take care of all of that. And what we do is we tap the 345 to the extent we can. Now let's say we can only tap that for 10 miles, but if we did an upgrade 15 miles away for the next five miles, we could get more utility. These are the type of things that happen that Wallingford isn't gonna be saddled with. We'll handle all of those things as part of the normal process. I will tell you that the uh, once once a data center has decided that they're going to locate in an area, um, and the siting council has approved it, they really take some pretty strong measures to work through the process with these towns. There's a great uh, Facebook video out you can see in New Albany, Ohio. It's got the mayor, the senator, everybody up the chain. Uh, in the video right down to the guys that uh, cut the lawn and, and service the, the text. And it's really about what happened out there in New Albany and how it works for the town. Um, great video, I showed it to the governor, uh, I showed, I'm sorry, I showed it in the governor's uh, conference room uh, to the commissioners and so forth and, and team up there. There's a lot of good stuff online you could see that not only Facebook has, but others. So I really believe that once we go to planning board, we will look to subdivide that big parcel into three. And then from there, we're gonna stop until we have the right building design at the right place. We may have to merge two, but we think 100 acre parcels are going to be what we're going to need to offer for a hyperscale data. Uh, it's, and that's what the market is today. But if we were gonna do a 16 meg building, we could probably go down to as small as 30 to 35 acres, which is the market today. If you have less than 35 acres and you're from California and you have to come in and deal with this type of regulation that is in data center support, or if you're Austin or Dallas, where most of the siting councils in the United States are located these days, it gets a little restrictive and they lose their patience very quickly with you. So I really need the flexibility to leave this open acreage and we'll divide it up. I can promise you we're not covering the earth. The planning board's not gonna allow it. We're gonna to have to default to some coverage quotients at some time, at some point, shape factor quotient setbacks and so forth. We understand all of that. So if you'll let us see who we can entice and the size of building and shape that they'll bring, we will carefully sort them out, put them on this side, that side, move them around. We have to kind of fit the puzzle pieces together on these sites. It's going to be a process. It's going to be a, um, a multi-layer process, starting at EDC, uh, deep electric company, all the way down to planning board zoning and so forth. And we get down to, uh, you know, finally, finally putting that shovel in the ground. Um, but it, but there's there's layers to come. But the very first step is to get a hosting agreement signed so we can advance the funding necessary to take these next steps and, and, and work with you. We will work with you as carefully as we possibly can all the way through this. Councilor Laffin. Thank you, sorry, I had to find my mic there. Um, so a lot of what I wrote down um, has already been said that Councilor Testa covered a lot of it and Councilor Marone hit on some of the points as well. Um, so I'll just highlight them quickly and then get to the question that that is different. Uh, so obviously I have a concern with the sound um, and urgency. Uh, 
I think, I mean, clearly you've got something uh, and I'm definitely interested, um, but I'm not sure that it's gonna happen tonight. And I, and I think if we push it too much, it won't and then it'll be gone. Uh, I'm not sure all the votes are totally there because of the reasons we've talked about and tightening up some things. Um, how quickly it comes back up, I guess that depends on how quickly things get tightened up. Um, for me, it, it's really, it is most important about the sound. And, and uh, Tim Ryan talked about, you know, the, the mayor saying a test drive or whatever. And, and I don't know if it's, a, if it's a thing, like I wish we could take a field trip out to one. I don't, I think there's that many that close, right? And you're not gonna ship us all over to Texas. Um, but to-, to I'm kind of American Express points now. Whoa, well, wait a minute, let's do before I get in trouble. Sorry, no, just kidding, guys. Um, <laughs> But so, but but really, because I think that's a, a big, I mean, the largest chunk of this for me is, is the sound um, and really disrupting the whole thing. And, you know, we've, we've seen, we've seen people come in, developers, the hotel you're talking about, guy came in, it was great. Um, and then, you know, he sold off the hotel in a year and, and everything was a little different. And so, so that leads to my, to my question. So, do you, do you rent, do you lease, or do you sell these off to these? Okay, this, I've been asked this a lot. I'll tell you exactly what happened. We yeah. started this from scratch. We worked on the legislative process. We lobbied everybody in the legislature. We got it passed with a huge vote, 91% House, 80% Senate. Then I yeah. got out and I started to work with the towns using national metrics after doing an exhaustive two-year study and traveling all over the country. With all of that, we're not selling a darn thing. We're keeping it and we're going to JV, j joint venture it with selected people. If they don't want to joint venture, we're not going to do it, okay? They're, we're going to work joint ventures out. And that means we have say through the process, we are going to do the permitting ourselves. That's our plan at this point. We're dealing with some very large companies right now and they want us to permit this because we have the local knowledge. We have the people, the boots on the ground, the right help to help us get this process through and they don't. So we intend to be with this project, stay with this project, and um, uh, and stay with it to the end. And we'll be, will God's space will be signed on. So there's, you know, so there's a quick understanding. Once we sign on with EDC, there are pass-through rights. So in other words, let's say you gave a mall a tax deal, okay, and it's a co-location company. Every tenant that comes in is part of that tax deal. So we had to have the legislation written this way. That's how this, so there's some pass-through rights. We're still responsible for the whole package, but we have some pass-through benefits and that's how we're attracting these people to come in. So we're keeping what we have. We intend to develop what we have. We're partnered up with in pre-construction, uh, our pre-construction advisors is Turner Construction in New York. I think I've told you this before. They are the largest data center buildings in the, uh, builders in the world. They have an office in Sheldon, Connecticut, right nearby. And Ben Kaplan, who's had a critical development for the entire world for, for uh, critical IT, is, is the person that I speak to uh, every other day, probably, about our process. So we have some of the best people around working uh, here. Uh, we're going to use the best people. And I just want to say this to get it out. The job is bonded from soup to nuts. The road cleaning is bonded. The construction and the financing is bonded. Every single thing is bonded through the process. And in this process, unlike any other build you'll ever see in the data industry, the day that the building needs to be delivered is the exact day it gets delivered because the servers are being built the day you order the building. They put the order in for the servers to go into the building. This is a very fine-tuned, high-tech process that many of us will never probably get to see firsthand. I was fortunate enough to see some data centers and, and do that, but it is, it is really something to see when you walk into a data center after going through three levels of security, including biometric, and you get in to see this stuff. It's really something. And I can tell you from standing outside these buildings, these aren't some big, noisy, cranking buildings. It's, it's, a, it's very quiet. There is levels of sound attenuation, but Wallingford will be able to tell the rest of the country that they have the, the most aggressive at this point uh, for sound. I will tell you the truth. I'm not sure on two of the buildings that we can get to the level you want us to be at. And I have spent hours and hours on the phone 
but I can't get an answer without going out there and doing an actual test in the field. And in that case, we won't be able to have those buildings and we're gonna have to deal with that. We're gonna have to put those buildings somewhere else. We might be able to buy more land and move those buildings, but if we're gonna stick to the sound requirement, these are the things we expect that we're gonna have to deal with in the permitting process. And we are no strangers to the permitting process. Councilman Laffin, if I just may interrupt for one quick second. So let's talk about just two major things that you talked about. The sound, I think, if I may, had you have to judge for yourself, but I think in the agreement, the sound is pretty much spelled out in a way that I think is very favorable to neighbors. You totally control that as a town. You totally control that as a town with your expert. So that's all in your hands. And no one can ask for anything more because it's laid out how it's going to happen, how it's going to be measured, and what is the expectation. And your sound guy says, yay or nay, and it's over with. And oh, by the way, they get to keep checking it, and we got to keep up with it. Tightening up the agreement. Let's be clear that uh, Attorney Small, and I would also say Attorney Farrell, who wrote and negotiated this agreement, did a great job. The outstanding issue in this agreement, if, if you read everything, you like everything else, the only question mark in this agreement is this. We want to stay off North Farms. We want to say stay off of um, the uh, Tank Williams Road. Road. Williams Road, and then we want to say off of, what's the other one? I forgot it all of a sudden. Tankwood, Williams, and North Farms. Stay off Tankwood. And we have a road in our, inside our system that stays off of that. The question is, what happens if we don't get planning, not planning, it's only inland wetlands approval to build those roads? What if there's something there we don't know about? We don't think there is. We think it's doable. But if there isn't, Janice and I had a conversation and it was said that we concluded with Attorney Farrell that we would show it to the council and let them decide how to deal with that issue, which is we, we want to stay off of it, the exception being construction issue, exception being the emergency if the town wants it. But if we can't get those approval over those two roads, through wetlands, what's the solution? We propose, and I have not talked to Janice because this came up today, which is let Town of Wallingford pick if we if we get closed off of those two. Clearly it wouldn't make any equitable sense to say, do all this, and if you can't get those wetland approvals, you can't access your property. That's just, I don't think anybody would say, yeah, I'll enter that agreement. So that's the only outstanding issue, if you like everything else in the agreement, which is different. But the only outstanding issue not written in this agreement is staying off North Farms. If Wetland doesn't approve it, then what? We're just okay. asking for access to the site. That's all, we're just gonna need access for 300 acres. We kind of need to re have some kind of access and 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 so will anybody else that develops the property so then are you are is or then are for your sake are you ready for the agreement to be agreed to tonight because if that hasn't been worked out that sounds like that's something you're trying to figure out oh well, so what we'd like to do is have the have the town decide if i can for a second talk and attorney small please join in here when attorney small and i had the conversation we brought this issue to the council. That's why it's not in the, it's not spelled out in the agreement to determine. We are, we know we're, we're explaining our wishes. We wanna stay off those roads. We're explaining how we're gonna do it. Jim is here to explain if need be the wetlands. We believe it to be minor, but we haven't done any soil testing. So what, we're not exactly sure what's in the field. We're gonna try our best. And under inland wetlands, the, the way the law goes is you have to show three different methods and to show that you're picking the least intrusive of the three methods, essentially. And if they approve us, they approve us. They don't approve us, we expect they're going to. We still have to have a, a, a backup plan, if you would, to access the site. And we're saying we would turn that over to you to say, tell us where you'd like that and we'll comply. And it could be written in the agreement that if we get denied by these two, you'll pick it. We're fine with that. 
But we can't say if we don't get these access, we have nothing. That's the real outstanding issue. Tony Small, would you have I mischaracterized anything on that? Well, I I'm hearing for the first time this idea that the town would pick how you access the right. property. I'm a little bit dumbfounded that you're buying all these properties without knowing how you can get in there. But so I, I'm really not even sure how to react to that. But it's also the issue of you wanted, I thought you wanted access for construction on the residential streets. So, um, so it was basically it just come down to an access issue. And I, honestly, the idea that the town would decide how you access the properties, I, I'm not really sure how to react to that at this point in time. That was a suggestion. I just want to be clear that when we when they entered into the agreements for the properties, we didn't know we'd be restricted from using those other properties. It was only after we entered into these agreements that it came up to be restricted on those other properties. So be it, and we're willing to help because we understand the issue, and we're saying we're going to do our best. But there's a what if that we can't answer. Mr. Chairman. Mayor. Yeah, just in listening, um, I'm I'm maybe incorrectly hearing perhaps a difference. I'm I'm not sure right now. Are we talking about access for construction purposes or are we talking about longer term access for use of the property after the construction is completed uh is is the access confined to construction period of time or is access uh beyond just the construction so the original mayor to answer that question the access we're talking about is the daily access and we were we were in our discussions with the town it was, we don't want to have daily access off those three roads, daily access. And we agreed and we found a way in, but it's subject to inland wetlands. And the question is, if inland wetlands stops us there, how do we get to the site? All right, so the daily access is car traffic. Is what, I'm sorry? Car traffic. Right. It's people going to work, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, and the construction obviously is not, and then there's the three-year replacement. What does the three-year replacement of all of the servers look like in terms of um, what's coming in and out? What, what'll happen in that case is you will see uh, a few dozen trailer trucks pull up and they begin to unload, and that unloading process takes uh, days. So the trailers don't move, they're on the site. At the end of that time, those trailers leave. The servers are swapped out one rack at a time. They're left on site in the storage area. And then sometime later, the trucks come in, they pick them up and they leave. And it could be a month, two months or three months between drop off and pick up, depending on the type of operation, depending on um, you know, the, the proprietary use. Mr. Chairman, Mayor, yeah, I, I'm I'm still a little I'm not not quite certain what the meaning is. Um, Attorney Fasano, uh, you indicated daily access was okay, but then then you indicated that you need to get on the property. So again, are you talking about the issue of just for construction, or is it a permanent access that extends beyond the construction, where where um, you 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 really want an ability to be able to come off of North Farms Road, not just for construction, but for for the use of the building uh, for whatever time period it's going to be used. So we believe that people didn't want us on those three roads for the day-to-day -day use of the building for as long as they've been there. So we looked 
to come off of Tower and Sterling to enter the property so that we would have no traffic on North Farms. And what we said was, if we were able to get that, that would be fine through Inland Wetlands, if that does happen. If we don't, we have to, we would ask the town to allow us to at least have something on North Farms Road so we could enter the site. We also said, in the event that we could stay off of North Farm Road and use Sterling and Tower to get into the site, we would use that for our construction as well. But if something came up that we, some turn radius, some issue that we're not aware of during the construction, we would look, we wanted it written in, we'd contact the town uh, and tell the town the problem and we, we would be allowed to come off of North Farms Road or one of those roads to bring a particular construction item, cement truck, what have you off of that road for whatever unique issue there was. So those are the two issues, one everyday use and one for construction. Does that help, Mayor? Yes, it helped. I, I think, you know, with specialized construction equipment or materials or whatever, uh, that's that's unforeseeable. And um, I, I don't personally, I don't see that as a major problem. But the daily use issue, um, it, that, that that that's a stumbling block because you know as far as I know it's, it's rare that a wetland issue would prevent the use of a property completely uh, it's, and, it's just it's just a matter agree, of and I agree with you that I don't think they could do that I do agree that from a legal standpoint but if they do we don't have a remedy for it and we will use every good faith because we want to stay off those roads but if they say no, we need some escape hatch, something. Okay, well, we hear you. I would have to discuss it further with uh, Janice and Jerry and and others before I could. So I we, we really, I need to know what is the council's position on the access issue? Because I, you know, we can write it any which way, but you know, as I've said to Attorney Fasano repeatedly, you know, I'm going to write it this way, prohibiting your using of these streets, and you, we need to get a reaction from the council because initially the reaction was mm -hmm. a negative response to the use of those streets. So, what is the level of acceptance of some use of the residential streets? What's the parameters, and then we can write it. It's not really my decision whether they get to use those roads or not. Um, you got to tell me. Uh, I, I don't know how we address that and address without addressing the whole situation. I mean, I think it's got to be part and parcel of it. But Councilor Laffin, you, you still have the floor. Yeah, it, that's what I was going to get at. Um, <clears throat> you know, to answer that question directly, to, to jump or whatever wherever we are i don't even know now um and I, I guess it really depends how many real employees are going to be there you know we've heard tonight 85 to 100 um and i think that might have been more of like a selling point for jobs in the area but how many of these could actually be remote or how many of these would would you know each building may necessitate 85 to 100 uh and you said what 35 security the, the 35 security is that 35 can do two buildings is that one property or is that you know, 35 combined is 70 people. Um, I guess that that would determine my opinion on the access to those roads. And I appreciate that, that you also have no interest in using those residential roads. But I, I think, you know, if and, and I'm jumping now away from where I was going about, I had questions about the lease and the, the assignment. And, and I understand you don't plan or think to do that. Um, but if I could just be blunt, and, and I think if we tried to do this tonight, it doesn't it doesn't happen, because the I'm I want this to happen ultimately, and I'm not comfortable. So I can't imagine that the other people that are leaning the other way or really more on the fence than I am are going to go forward with the back and forth that we just had with the town attorneys and the mayor, and, and we're not certain. Um, I mean, that's just I'm breaking it down. I'm just going to pull it out 
and be blunt about it um, because I don't want to I don't want to lose the whole thing. Gotcha. So I hope that there's an interest to to get it done and get it done right. Um, and you know, like Council Marone said, like you know, sometimes we take a long time. Uh, and I know that this has been. I I was talking to Tim Ryan about data centers ten years ago. Uh, and I know he's been actively working with you guys for a while, but but it is it is newer to us. Um, so I think it, if it gets pushed tonight, the votes aren't there. Um, and the hesitancy between the discussion that we just that was that was a negotiating team and and they don't know and it, and they're they're still not certain so that's not figured out so another reason but if i can ask my question about the the assignment again i understand and i love that you have no plan to to sell um but i i still want to just understand the question better i guess or understand what would happen if better um with it's on page 15 of the lease uh at the top paragraph um the header for that is number 10 assignment which the header is actually on page 14 of the copy that i have uh and it could be just the way i imported it but um halfway through it talks about how wallingford's involved uh and it says and judged by wallingford to be both the, this is the purchaser whoever it's going to get assigned to judged by Wallingford to be both creditworthy and capable of performing the obligations of God's space under the agreement. Such judgment by Wallingford shall be based upon criteria acceptable in the financial industry. Such consent by Wallingford will not be unreasonably held. So it might be more of a question for Janice or, um, I'm sorry, Attorney Small or Attorney Farrell. Um, what does that mean for us? Like, what is what responsibility or limitations does that really put on us? Like, can we kibosh an entire sale, or is it just kind of a due diligence thing? And there are these standards that we're not seeing right now at this time, or are not decided at this moment. Does Attorney Small want to answer that, or I can answer it? Well, I thought is Jerry. Um, it's it's really it's the due diligence thing. Um, this that language was drafted by Attorney Farrell. Um, you know, it's it's a protection against. Uh, you, you have to give them the right to assign the agreements um, from other deals. I can tell you, you don't get financing if you don't have these types of protections in there. But we wanted to have some safeguard, and that's why that language was added. Um, obviously, you know, we can't withhold, we can't just be arbitrary about it, um, but it's a due diligence to, to give some comfort level to the town in the assignment, um, but without having the right to just say no. Okay. And you know, this is here. Attorney Farrell. That's the way I meant it as well. Yes, it's a due diligence thing. Okay. All right. So, I mean, I guess I'll wrap up my comments there. Um, because it, it, I kind of ended up going a different direction. I mean, I know these aren't really plans. It, it even says conceptual, and we talked about how they these could be completely different. But we do we did or we do need some sort of idea of what these what these could look like. Again, like I want this, um, but I want to make sure it happens and it happens right. Uh, so I don't want to. I know you're, it's you know there's an urgency, but I don't want to rush it to the point of losing it. Um, and unless I'm going to be greatly surprised by the the speakers that are following me. And uh, I think if we rushed it tonight, it wouldn't happen, especially with the back and forth and stuff we just had that that needs to be figured out in black and white, um, not just in a well, in the meeting, we kind of said. Um, so uh, that's it for me now, Mr. Chairman. And and thank you um, and everybody else for, for being here. Thanks. Councillor Shortell. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Thanks everyone for your work on this. I appreciate it. I know it's it's a lot. Uh, I, I made a note. I guess it must have been two hours ago. I never knew Councillor Testa used to be an inland wetlands commissioner. So I was this many years old when I found that out. Vinny Testa is a Renaissance man. Um, anyway, that joke would have been funnier like two hours ago. But uh, <laughs> um, you know, I I, I struggle with this. Uh, because I, I, I feel like, uh, number one, I commend the mayor, I commend the EDC, I commend, you know, this is what you're bringing an opportunity to us. This is what you're supposed to do. 
and it's it that's a good thing you know we should be looking at stuff uh that we all know about the, the the tax base shrinking and all that so i i'm appreciative of all that and all the work that went into it um and I, I guess I, I, I do find myself uh, kind of on the other side of this, that I'm not necessarily in favor of it. And it really has nothing to do with the exchange that just happened. Uh, I don't know that you can resolve my concerns. Um, I kept having flashbacks to 2010 and Obamacare. Uh, you have to pass Obamacare to know what's in it. And I feel like there's a parallel here. You have to, we have to vote this in to find out all these other things about planning and zoning and inland wetlands. And that's disturbing to me. And I think what's disturbing to me is, is, well, not disturbing, but but this is the point where we get to decide if this is a good thing or not for the town. Planning and zoning is not, they don't, that's not their job. Their job legally, and I'm not a lawyer, like I like to say, but legally their job is to evaluate a proposal based on regulations. Inland Wetlands job is to evaluate a proposal based on standards. So that's not our job. I don't have to evaluate, I could have, I don't have to give you a reason. I could say, I just don't want to do it. I'm in a bad mood. No. Or I'm in a good mood. Yes. You know, I, this is the one place where we get to make the decision on whether it's right or it's not right. And I guess I, I, I don't like, you know, I, I, I don't, I mean, we got the agreement at 4.30 on a Friday and, and th look, you guys are working hard on it. Janice is working hard on it. I understood. That's a little rough though, as a counselor to get that 4.30 on a Friday. Um, but I look at, you know, we've, we've talked about the noise ordinance. We, we can't enforce the ordinance we have. It's expensive to enforce the ordinance we have. So when I hear, well, you're, you'll have the best ordinance in the country. Really? Okay. Well, the, or, the noise ordinance is expensive. You have to hire a professional. It's a, it's at least today, it's a daily ordinance. I think it was mentioned. It could be a weekly one or something, but, but I mean, with the Thurston situation, that was one of the issues. We couldn't even do the testing every day. We weren't going to spend the money, the thousand dollars a day to hire the tester. Um, so that's a concern for me. And I, you know, I echo what Councilor Marone said. I mean, it took us a year to do littering, but we're at warp 9.5 with this. And I, that's a problem for me as a counselor. Um, I don't like making decisions based out of fear. And that's what this feels like, fear. If you don't do this, I feel like I'm, in, I'm being asked to, to reconcile. On the one hand, industry's not coming to Connecticut because of circumstances. But on the other hand, if you don't do this, industry's gonna come and put something worse in that parcel. And I'm trying to reconcile those arguments or that, oh, they put these things in the city. Okay, well, Wallingford's not a city. Wallingford's not, you know, New Jersey, which is a state. But I mean, I, I guess I'm not, um, so, so those are my concerns with this and I'm, you know, I'm, I understand the risk. What if it sits there empty and we don't get any tax revenue from it? Cause it's, I get that. That's a risk. Um, we have a lot of open space in Wallingford. We, we pride ourselves on our open space. We pay higher taxes to have open space, but I, I, I will never make a decision based on fear. And while I appreciate that we need to be finding new businesses, finding opportunities, I don't, my, my concerns, I don't think are going to be resolved in another meeting. Um, I'm, I'm trying to keep an open mind. Uh, I was a kid in the 70s when, when Barnes Park was built. And I often think about, well, if I were a counselor in the 70s, well, I'd probably, I'd probably really, really hate it. But uh, would I have been against that? Because that worked out for the town. And so I don't want to be that guy. And I, and I try to keep an open mind to say, well, Barnes Park worked out. That was empty land. And that's not apples to apples right here, but I, but I am. So I'm trying to think that, like, is this the Barnes Park you know, of the 70s, is this that type of decision? And if we say no, are we really missing out on something? But I just worry about, especially with what we went through um, with the Thurston issue, with the noise, uh, and Thurston warned us, not their, I mean, they, they warned us. They're, I think they were great about it, frankly. It's not a knock against them. But um, I remember at that time saying, I wish they, I wish they, like the town had drawn the map better in the 50s or the zone, whenever they made the zones, because then when Thurston went in then the neighborhood went in later on, so I feel like we're at a point now that we're, we, we don't have to do this, um, but we're the only ones that don't, you know, again, if, if the rationale for voting yes as a counselor is don't worry about the sound, don't worry about the logistics, that's the other count, the other commissions deal with that, that doesn't work for me because they don't evaluate just philosophically is it good for the town. I'm just not convinced that it is with all due respect to everything you guys are doing. Um, so that's where I am on this. I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Attorney Small. 
I, ju I just want to clarify, there's not going to be a new ordinance with respect to the sound. The sound is in this agreement because we're going to have a contractual relationship and a contractual right to enforce it. And that is why we were adamant that it would be in this agreement as opposed to relying upon any other agency or the noise ordinance. We've said it, and I've said it repeatedly from the very beginning that I did not believe the noise ordinance would be sufficient to deal with this. So we had a consultant give us advice on that. That paragraph is written based upon that advice and it's been accepted by the developer. Um, tonight's the first time I'm hearing it's the str most stringent in the country. I'm a little bit doubtful of that, but whatever, it doesn't matter. They've agreed to it, it becomes a contractual obligation, um, which I think is a far superior position to be in than to simply say, well, planning and zoning can deal with it. Planning and zoning can deal with noise to some extent, but when you say something is permitted in the zone, your control over it is not quite as great as, as it is in this agreement, which gives us a contractual right to say, no, you will do this. Um, and if you don't do that, you're in breach of agreement. So I just wanted to clarify that point. Thanks, Councillor Tata. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll just start off by saying I, I like the concept of this. Um, I think it's great. I was kind of excited when I, you know, when I first heard about it. Um, it's going in an industrial zone, which is, I think it's a, a great solution for an industrial zone. Um, you know, we were talking before about how manufacturing is kind of a thing of the past, unfortunately, around here. And, um, you know, so here's what we end up getting. We get a lot of warehouses. And a lot of times when the warehouses want to come in, um, a lot of the neighborhoods um, around there complain because they say there's trucks 24 hours, there's, you know, pollution, there could be runoff, there's employees coming and going 24 hours a day. And this really doesn't have any of that. So, um, so I do think it's a great solution for industrial zone. Um, it's basically a, you know, a big building and it doesn't create a lot of those problems that we see with a lot of other options that we get um, in industrial zones nowadays. So, so I'll just start off by saying that I like the idea. A um, couple of maybe concerns or, or comments though, with that being said, um, kind of like several other counselors have said, I, I I have a hard time voting on this tonight because I don't think what we have is the finished product. Um, Attorney Small said before, um, I believe her, her words were, some things in the agreement need cleanup. Uh, the mayor said, mentioned that there was something that is a stumbling block. Um, so I, I don't, it's hard for me to vote on an agreement when I don't think this is the final agreement. So I don't know how we how we're expected to vote on something if if this isn't the final product. And, and it's something that's gonna the town is committed to for 30 years. So it's a it's a serious decision. And so if I don't feel like this is the final product, I I don't really feel comfortable voting on it um, until it's finalized. So I would I would hope and I understand you know your your timing, but I would hope we could maybe just get up more of a final product. Um, and I think Councillor Shortel had mentioned, we've, we've had things trickling in all week, which is not, with something this big, it's not the the best for us. Um, typically we get our agendas on Wednesday for the, the following Tuesday and we can kind of plan and budget our time and make sure we have the time to read through everything and ask questions. And with this, things kind of kept trickling in. Um, we just got some revised maps at 3.30 this afternoon. And I, I mean, Tuesdays for me, it's auction day. I don't have, I don't have time on Tuesdays to read, to read through things before a meeting. So it's, uh, you know, that it wasn't the best, um, you know, the best for us planning wise to, to really commit the time to, to looking through everything. Um, so, but, but again, I think those are, you know, those are things we could, I think maybe a little bit more time might be, might, might be helpful here if, if you can't afford to do that. But um, my next, my next thing I wanted to bring up was that um, nobody asked this question and I don't know, I don't, I don't think Mr. Bose is, is with us anymore at these meetings. I don't know if Mr. Senna maybe can figure it out for me, but we talk about tax revenue and how you know we get a million dollars from certain buildings and maybe two million dollars from other buildings. But my question is, what would the tax revenue be if there was not the tax incentive? 
So I'm looking to find out from maybe the comptroller's office, um, or I mean, I don't think anybody can do the math off the top of their head tonight, but what would our tax be if there were no tax break? Um, so I, I'm just trying to see if, if the million dollars is really a good deal for the town or not, because if, if normally you would be, I don't really know where the million dollars came from. So if you would maybe be giving us, you know, $20 million, then maybe a million dollars isn't so great. But if you would normally be giving us 2 million, then, then maybe a million is okay. So if, um, I could, so if I could interrupt, sure. if, if you were listening when Jason, when Councillor Zandri was asking questions earlier, um, he asked, you know, what, what kind of building would produce the one and a half million in revenue and the, the figure that, was battered around was about 35 to 40 thousand 40 million dollars um so these are 400 million dollar buildings so if you multiply that times 10 that's what you're looking at for potential tax revenue 10, 10 times what's being proposed so but is that is that the building or is that include the personal property tax because i'm assuming these computers that are in there are valued at millions of dollars also right so um, I'm going to leave those who have been on the ground floor of this to talk about it. But the, the issue is the way our taxes are structured in Connecticut and in the Northeast, um, typical property taxes are, are prohibitive to these projects coming to us. So that's why the state legislature developed uh, this, this pilot program. To, that's why we're talking about this tonight. Yes, understood. But what, what I'm what I'm trying to understand is, let's say something else came on that property, a warehouse, and they're paying full taxes and they don't have the tax incentive because they don't have the state statute to serve them. Well, you know, I'm trying to figure out how much we could potentially be giving up by entering into this for 30 years. So, and, and obviously we don't know what else could come, so you can't really compare that. So I'm just trying to compare this to itself, basically, to kind of get an idea. So um, with manufacturing- Can I respond to that? For for, for real property, the manufacturing building would have to have a fair market value of $35 million. Okay. I, don't, I don't think that exists in Wallingford. Um, I don't think there's a lot of property any place that one property is $35 million worth of real estate property. So that's why the figure is high because it more than compensates the town. That's why a lot of towns like this. It more than compensates the town for that revenue that it would be lost if it was a regular commercial industrial property. I'd like to add to that, if I may. Sure. All right. So the bottom line is that we can't have anybody come to the state of Connecticut because they won't unless you have certain market delta national tax advantage programs. So you have, to, you have to figure out what the market is and you have to match the market. That's what we've done. Now from that, we've had to work backwards. That's how we got to the hosting fee agreement numbers. It's a scientific approach. On top of that, we knew that we could be have an added benefit with final mile pricing to the electric company. So it's important to see the look to look at the total economic benefit. And that's what the other towns have seen because I was allowed really to spend more time in detail discussing these things with the town. But I will tell you that the total economic build, uh, benefit per building is going to be in the vicinity of 3.6 to 3.8, could be 4 million, depending on the type of use. And this is why I can't give you an exact number. This is not going to be a ball bearing plant manufacturing facility. This is about how some people use one third of the building, some use a half. That's all gonna make a difference on megawatts of electricity, which all comes down to the payment. So listen, we have all the information. I'm happy to do a seminar on it in Wallingford. I could explain it to you from soup to nuts, every single bit of this, who's in the market, who the movers and shakers are, what they do, all of the different antics. So these buildings, there is no way that I can figure based on current Wallingford zoning, unless you had a multi high rise building that you could ever even get close to the total economic benefit to the town of Wallingford with any other business, whether or not it's a fifth of the taxes or an eighth of the taxes, you can't get any closer with anything else. And, uh, and I, 
I, I would need you know the time to get into the weeds a little with you to explain that, which we're not going to do tonight. But uh, I can assure you that it's a it's a better than anything else deal. Okay, fair can. enough. Yep, that, uh, <laughs> got it. All right. Um, so that <laughs> that takes care of that. So um, the only other comment I wanted to make too about as far as I mean. I think I've said this before on the council. Philosophically, I'm kind of against tax abatements. I'm not a fan. Um, I understand, you know, and when the EDC asks us for them, I, I get what we're trying to do. We're trying to get businesses to come. Um, but I don't think they're fair for the existing businesses who don't get them. Um, and so philosophically, it's tough for me to to get over that. But I will say, I in this case, you know, Connecticut did this. The state of Connecticut says we're going to set up this program because data centers aren't coming basically because Connecticut is not a great state to do business in. And so because Connecticut is not a great state to do business in, they have to set this up. And then Wallingford ends up giving, you know, basically a, a sweet tax deal to somebody because the state of Connecticut is a terrible place to do business in. But the state of Connecticut is not fixing their reasons of why they're a terrible place to do business in. So we have Wallingford who's great to do business in, but we can't get people because the state is so terrible to do business in. So then the state comes up with a program and we have to give away tax money. So I understand, <laughs> I get why this all has to happen. And for Wallingford to maybe get this business, we have to do that, but I don't like it. I don't like that whole concept. So, um, you know, that's, I just wanted to say that I'm not, I think the issue is with the state. And if the state were just better to do business in, then People would just come to do business here. We wouldn't. We wouldn't have to be dealing with any of these these things. But, but anyway, that's what it is. So here we are. Um, the, the other, the last thing I have. Um, we had mentioned before the electric agreement. I assume the electric division is going to going to be making a profit off of this. Do we know how much that's going to be? Because that would help the Wallingford ratepayers also. I'm assuming. It's going to help them massively, but I don't want to discuss that on the Zoom meeting because we haven't met with the electrical company yet. I will tell you that we have term. This is not going to be a contract, so let's. We might as well get out this over tonight, so it's not an extra meeting or two tying everybody up. So we're going to looking for a non-binding term sheet, exactly what we have in the other towns. It carefully explains who's buying, who's selling, day ahead market purchase, and it describes what the margin. Just like buying, selling, trading stock, what margin the town gets on every single you know, kilowatt that we buy? What's the margin? And it's all going to be in the agreement, nice and clean. The security is going to be there for the agreement, bonding, letters of credit, deposits in advance, whatever the town needs, that's what these companies do. These are AAA plus rated companies. You know their names. Uh, there are no bankruptcies. There are no, we're leaving. Once someone puts $400 million down, they're not leaving anytime soon. And building the infrastructure for another $20 million to get the electricity there. They're not leaving anytime soon. They have a long-term plan. Plus, data center land is valuable. And in this particular case, uh, I think there's going to be a finite number of buildings that are going to be in Wallingford and a finite number per site. Um, I just want to make one last comment. I heard I heard um, uh, Councilor Chartel talk about uh, fear and the push to get this done. Um, we're not trying to make anybody fearful. We have, we are against a rapidly developing 20%, during COVID, 20% increase and expected to be more than 20% this year increase in the data industry. This timing is absolutely critical. Every single week, I had a customer to come a couple few weeks ago to Wallingford for over a million square feet. We didn't quite get it done, I understand. It's been put off a couple times. I'd like to get it done and at least show them. Now, there's a latency situation with this customer. This customer wants a certain speed. Not all customers need a certain speed, but Wallingford has this for this particular customer's proprietary use, the speed. So getting this done helps us get a data center ahead of other states like Pennsylvania, who's right now going to have a new data tax law. Now you're saying Pennsylvania, that's way over there. Not at light speed, it's not, it's not, it's not. It's on the other side of New York. So we wanna to try to get these customers. 
I am aggressively, aggressively working on this process. And it's sometimes hard for me to hear, you know, we, we're going to take, I understand you need time. We've been with this as, as, uh, as uh, Tim Ryan said, for a very long time. Unfortunately, you just got the last draft uh, just a few days ago. I will tell you the town's been great to work with. I've been in a, uh, a couple of meetings with the mayor and, and, and economic development and power and so forth. They've been great. Um, we are really trying to get this accelerated. I have dates for people to come, CEOs of companies to come. You'll be very impressed if you knew their names. Everything is under NDA, both sides. But I will bring you quickly, I, I hope, I'm planning on it. We have leads for it. We're, we're actively engaged in bringing some serious business to Wallingford. And we'll bring it in and we'll discuss it with EDC. We'll discuss it with the mayor. There'll be no secrets. We'll talk about what these people you know, are, are looking to do and how they would want to do it, what shape the building would be. Then we'd have to figure out what site to put them on. And that's going to be a joint effort. OK, it's got to be a joint effort. They may want to be right next to 91 on that site because it's got to be quicker into the fiber chain, which is the main trunk. These are all things we need to sort out that we cannot do until we get a basic hosting agreement signed. And after that's done, a utility, non-binding utility term sheet, exactly what we have with the other municipals. And if we get those two things, you can let me off my leash and I can go bring some business in and we can all do very well with it. Well, and, and what you just yes. said, I guess, I guess that's my my question then. What, it, the agreement, are we agreeing to those specific locations? Because it seems like, I think from what I'm hearing from some of the counselors is that maybe we're okay with some of them, but not others. So if we say yes to this agreement tonight, are we agreeing that all of those properties are okay? You are agreeing to the list of the properties that were given to you uh, through uh, Attorney Small. And it looks like a lot of properties, but it's one family that owns multiple properties, a farm that owns like eight properties. So it looks like a lot of properties. Uh, but you would be agreeing to that list that is attached to the agreement as for the properties. As for the buildings, no, this is conceptual. It depends upon a bunch of things. It's gonna depend upon topography. It's gonna to depend upon wetlands. It's gonna depend upon the person that Tom brings to the table, whether they want a 16 or a 32 or one in between or however all that works. We were asked to show some sort of concept. So that's what we did through the engineer. But at the end of the day, uh, we would have to, once, as Tom puts it, he's unleashed, you go out to find these folks. That's when planning and zoning would get more involved. And the public would have a right to come in and say no or yes or whatever they want. And it would be treated like a normal development process. Okay. So, because I, I know I was um, speaking to a family on uh, Tinkwood Drive, I think, that has some concerns. And I, I completely understand their, their concerns with one of the buildings. Um, it, it did seem very close to residential. So, if we agree to these properties, we're not necessarily, they would still have a chance, you know, planning and zoning, whoever would still say, like, hey, we know you have this agreement, but you're not putting a building right here. Or you, you are agreeing to the financial terms in particular. You are agreeing to the sound issue, a standard that everyone's going to be held to. And you are agreeing to that these buildings are going to look a particular way in terms of design. We have to talk about the street issue, so that's out there. But where they are and the buffers and all that stuff, planning and zoning, and the people in Tankwood and other places could come and tell planning and zoning what they think. Because we can't do that at this level. We don't have the tools. Yeah. We have a whole right. yeah. yeah, so you need the agreement first, basically, before Correct. you get um, All right, and then I guess just, then just my last question would be for maybe for Attorney Small or, or maybe even for the mayor. It sounds like there's still some things that need to be maybe edited a little bit or ironed out. Um, so if we agree to this agreement tonight, then this is not the final agreement. So then do they need to come back and we have to agree on another agreement or is it better just to wait to have those those issues resolved first well i think you should 
have everything in line. So really, so the the tweaks to the agreement, it's just, that's really just like a clerical thing where there's references to different sections that need to be um, corrected because the uh, agreement's been revised numerous times. So the key, really, the key outstanding issue is the access and how much, um, is there some room to negotiate from the council's perspective access off of the residential streets? Okay, so are are you looking to gauge that from us? Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, because I mean, it's, it's not my decision whether they can use those roads or not. It's not for me to decide. So I need to know how do you want me to, how do you want us to handle this? I mean, from their perspective, they, they have valid points about how to develop the sites and, and having access and whether or not they'll have entire access. I mean, they're not being unreasonable from their perspective, but we have our own perspective and I kind of need to have feedback as to how I'm supposed to write this if, um, if there's some validity to what they're arguing. And keeping in mind, I mean, I think the two main concerns with respect to access, from my perspective, and you could disagree with it because I'm just the person who's, who's supposed to be writing it, um, once place is built, with the exception of the, the turnover of the personal property, you're talking about cars and not a lot of them. So that would be one factor that I would consider if I was deciding whether or not they can use, um, have some provision to deal with the residential streets. Secondly, I, I do think it's somewhat concerning that the build out could be over an extended period of time, given that there could be multiple buildings. Um, but the third point, which I have not mentioned before, which as I'm sitting here, um, you can't, we can, the issue of access can be left to planning and zoning if, if that's what you so choose um, and have them work it out. I mean, the goal of this agreement was to lock in um, certain terms that the town as a whole viewed to be um, very important, which obviously the sound one I think is the most important one. Um, but that would also be an alternative is because you don't know where the buildings are going to go, um, how to access it. They haven't done all of the groundwork for the actual construction of any roads or anything. Um, that could be something that could be dealt with at planning and zoning. Um, if you so choose, and then we would just take that part out. That's that's what I need some feedback on as to how we're going to write this for you um, and finalize the agreement if you're inclined to, to support this. Yeah, and I would, I don't know if, if you can maybe let me know if this is possible, but one thing I would like to see if, if we are still kind of editing a few things in the agreement, I would, because Councilor Stewart tells that before, I believe, you know, planning and zoning, their job is basically just to say this, this meets the regular, the, you know, the zoning or it doesn't. Um, so I don't know that they will have the latitude to say, oh, we just don't like a building here. I mean, if it meets the zoning, then it meets the zoning. So are we able to put in the agreement that we want any building X amount of feet away from any residences? Is that something we can add? Well, you certainly, I mean, you can take the position that you want that, but that's why we have a consultant on board to say that, um, you know, that would require, it would be pretty arbitrary. We can't just pick a certain number of feet away and say everything will be rosy if it's that far away. I mean, the analysis has to be done by experts. And, you know, our expert has told us, yes, we should be concerned about this. And that's why that section was written that way. But he's also said that buildings and the equipment and their enclosures can be designed to deal with that. So I think that to say in this agreement, well, you know, you have to be X number of feet away. I don't know who's setting that standard because the science hasn't been done to go with it. So Right, but you, so you're referring to sound. I'm referring more to aesthetics. So I mean, a lot of well, aesthetics would be would that would be planning and zoning. You keep in mind that they have to create the regulation by which to allow 
these uses on these properties. Okay. So, you know, they already have setback regulations. For example, that, you know, I, I believe that if the building is a certain height for each, for each foot you go up higher, you have to go back farther. And there's, there's various ways um, that planning and zoning would address by creating a regulation that provides for different types of setbacks and whatnot. Um, you know, I, it may very well be that this use is allowed, but only as a special permit, which means that the commission then has discretion to say, you know what, this one works perfectly on this piece of property, but not so much on that piece of property. So that is within their jurisdiction. Um, okay. But if it's, you know, the issues that are primary important um, from our perspective, because we have the ability to say, no, we don't really like this, but we're not hearing that tonight. There seems to be um, support for this to go forward. Um, you know, what needs to be in this agreement? And so we put those agreement, those items in there beyond the financials that we view to be quite important, particularly the sound, um, but certainly with respect to how the roads are built within um, 300 acres of land, that, you know, that is something that would could be left to the purview of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, so okay. I'm, just, I'm just saying it as a thought, but if you want, if we, you know, we did propose that it be in here, um, but if there is, you know, there a consensus from the council that we do need to put in some some checks for them, for the developer to have some options in the event something doesn't work out. I need to know that so I know how to draft it. Um, they did give me some language today. I think it's a, a little bit on the weak side, but I don't I don't know until you tell me where you're at on this position, and then we can go and finalize it. Yeah. Um, well, that's I think that's important what you just said. So so planning and zoning needs to make a new regulation for data centers. So. Correct. So After they're this, yes. Right. Yes. So they're all right. So that's important. So they're they'll be creating. So they can they can say like what I just suggested that they want it to be X amount of feet away, or it has to have right. trees in front of it, or whatever. Because um, you know these, I feel bad for you know some of the residences. You know they've looked at farmland for <laughs> however many years, and now they're you know this is a big change for them. And I you know so well, I, but it's it's been the IX zone for a very long time. So. Right. Right. True, right. It is an industrial zone, absolutely. Um, but I, I, you know, as much as we could help them, I think, you know, that I think that helps Correct. everybody. <laughs> if the neighbors are all happy, then everybody, you know, <laughs> let's try to make as many people happy as we can. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I guess then, um, I mean, I, I think that's that's all I have. I, I just wanted to ask you, too, Attorney Small, do you, are you satisfied with the noise, um, with what we did with the noise, the way that it's in the agreement that we have? Do you think that's sufficient? Well, they, that um, language is drafted um, through the recommendations of our consultant um, who did review the language that was drafted from his letter um, by Attorney Pisano. Um, you know, there was parts of it we didn't agree to and we're satisfied with that section. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on sound, but that's based upon our experts' advice. Okay. Um, all right, I think that's a, that's all I have. Sorry that that took a little longer than I anticipated, but um, I think we I think we got a lot of questions answered. So, thank you, Mr. Ryan. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to be brief. Uh, I just want to address a couple of Councilor uh, Tato's questions and comments, uh, but I'll start with Councilor Laffin's comment about the fact that we've been trying to attract data centers to the town of Wallingford for years. We want to leverage the cost of our power, the reliability of our power. And bottom line is, it's not happening. And it was not going to happen. And we had numerous brokerage firms, the big CB Richard Ellis, you know, um, ORNL just tell us, forget it. You, you guys are fighting a losing battle. They will never, ever come. So in comes Mr. Quinn. And he is he has orchestrated the, the the pathway by which they will come. So, Councilor Tata, your comments about shame on the state of Connecticut. I could not agree with you more. They have painted themselves into a, in a into a complete corner where the only way that they can get this type of industry to the state is by you know <laughs> bribing them to come. 
which which is an absolute shame. Senator Fasano, with all due respect, I know you fought the good fight for years with economic developers throughout the whole region trying to improve business conditions, but it is what it is. So I just wanted to, to, to share that point. I also, in terms of your question, which I think is a great question, well, how do we know whether this is a good deal for Wallingford from a tax perspective? So I did early on take Shelby Jackson, our tax assessor, into my confidence on this whole thing and said, let's play situation. I mean, if this was a fully taxable data center, what would it look like? Well, the, the, the long and short of it is, of course, we'd be generating a lot more tax. But I would, I would ask the council to look at this from an opportunity perspective. This is a good deal for us because the opportunity is such that if we don't do it, we're going to get zero. Look, look at what we're getting on these properties now. We're getting zero. All right. Um, and we have the opportunity to generate you know, several million, several million dollars. So it's, and um, Councillor Zandri did some calculations that I, I totally concur with. It's a matter of what else would go there. But what Mr. Quinn and his team have been able to do is get property owners to the table to agree on purchase agreements. Now, to get contiguous property owners to the table to do that, frankly, takes money. It's masterful. We can't get it to happen in downtown Wallingford. We can't get three property owners on one site to get, come to the market and agree on a price. And so you know what, what assemblage is, is extremely complicated. So I would submit that we have talked to those, many of those farmers, several of them multiple times about different opportunities that have come their way over time. And each case I, we get not interested. Well, they're interested now because Mr. Quinn has shown them some pretty good numbers, and that's what got them to the table. So my, it's the whole point is opportunity. If this is not, if this doesn't happen, I would submit that they will, those, those properties will sit idle for longer than I'll be around to watch them, I'm afraid. So I think the opportunity is there. Again, my only caveat has been all along scale, 500 acres, is a lot of property and that could change the complexion of our community so i'd ask you to just be cognizant of that when you're when you're you know putting together your host agreement but i think all the other you know um uh, positives line up it's a good opportunity for us uh you know given the right scale thank you mr chairman thank you i am out of comments from the council and on to the public, and I think the first member of the public who asked to speak was Adelheid Kofer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Adelaide Kofer, 35 Whittletree Road. Um, I want to say I do like the idea in principle. I like it much more than the warehouse, for sure. And I really wish we could have that on Fife Research Park, Parkway um, instead of the warehouse that's proposed right now. But that being said, um, I, I do agree with what some councillors have mentioned previously. And I do ask that the council take a little more time to deliberate on this agreement. Um, mainly two aspects I wanted to bring up. One is the selection of the sites. Um, the plan of conservation and, and development, give me one second to pull it up so I can quote correctly. Plan of Conservation and Development mentions um, as a goal a strategy to, pres to preserve existing agricultural operations in Wallingford, um, going on preserving prime farmland, and to the extent practical, the avoidance, minimization, minimization and or mitigation of the loss or conversion of agricultural lands associated with development actions. So I, I just wanted to mention that and ask why we focus or we fixate on these particular parcels that currently, as far as I understand, are to a big part farmland or woodlands. I think that the, the same goals would apply to woodlands as well. And then the other point I would like to make um, is, as Tim Ryan mentioned, the scale. Um, 
maybe two questions for clarifications. Mr. Queen, you mentioned a couple of times hyperscalers. Is that the right word? Can you can you can you please explain? Is that is is a 32 megawatt building? Does that count as a hyperscaler, or would that be way more? There's no firm definition on number, but approximately industry standards are 32 and above are considered a hyperscale building. Now, a co-location company could go into that building size, but a hyperscaler is Google, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and a number of others are considered hyperscale companies. And then there are co-location companies like Digital Equinix, T5, uh, Cyrus One and so forth. There's a whole line of companies that just do co-location work. So it really has to do with number of megawatts used and size of building footprint. And would you count any, is, is any kind of Bitcoin mining operations associated with that? Uh, we wouldn't want to have Bitcoin mining because it uses the electricity that we need to run the servers. Now, if we were a, so you're not confused about this, if we were a primary, if we owned a nuclear power plant that was servicing, uh, we would have servicing the data centers, we would have additional power that we could burn off and then that would be an attractive source. But no, that that type of uh, thing doesn't work with a general data center operation and you need the utilities to, to succeed. Okay, thank you. I'm still a little confused and concerned about the scale. Um, so a 32 megawatt building, and you were talking possibly four on that property, property or the, the conjunction of properties that we were talking mostly tonight. But we're also talking about four possible sites. So that could scale up to not only four times 32, but 16 times 32 or, or more? Or am, am I correct there? Yeah, you have these size and not quite these size, but pretty large industrial buildings right now in Wallingford. So a 32 meg building at two stories is about three acres on the ground. You do have buildings that are three acres, a bunch of them in Wallingford right now. So um, yeah, that's three acres footprint, okay? Um, if it's two stories. Some companies don't wanna be two stories, they'll be one story, but we've proposed for this package two stories. So we have the option to attract the companies that say, unless you give me two stories, we're not coming because they have a very proprietary design. And these engineers that I've met out in Silicon Valley and Sarah Clanna County, they have a formula they use for rack storage and design and heat loss and the whole formula. And if they can't build what they've designed, they just won't come here. So we have to have a number of options available. Sounds, sounds good. And I, I really appreciate that you negotiate with all those um, clients. But I again, I wanna go back to the scale of the electricity. Um, if we're talking uh, about as Mr. Ryan mentioned, and, and that's what I found in, in the Wallingford Electric um, package as, as well. So just this one property, four buildings each at 32 megawatts would double. And not, not only that, that is the peak load of Wallingford Electric, if I understand that correctly. And then possibly even more other properties quadrupling that. So I, I have a hard time seeing how Wallingford Electric would say, oh, sure, go ahead. We'll just buy quadruple so, the amount of, so here's of how, power. So here's how it works. It's good you asked that question. Here's how it works. All the energy produced in New England goes into the ISO New England grid. It flows through wires and goes all the way all around New England. Some areas have a big, we'll call it an electrical road, a big electrical road, and some have little country dirt roads. Wallingford's got a big electrical road running through it. So the energy is available regionally, not exactly in Wallingford, but in that general area, that, that traveled area there with 345 kV and so forth is very good. By the way, there's also one down near Groton that we're also accessing. So that's the energy. Now, it doesn't make any difference to Wallingford utility because what we're going to do is take a wire 
from the 345 through existing pathways where there's already a, a come off on the 345. We're going to go down there. We're going to build up a better structure. Instead of a wooden stick, we're going to put a metal stick, right? And we're going to put the what? So we're hardening, we're helping to make the, the grid stronger when we do this. And we have to do it by the latest standards, not the standards it was built in years and years ago. Now we bring those wires, let's say there's one or two 115 kV wires that come in, and we bring it right to the center of where these data centers are. And then from there, it goes to a substation, which we pay for. And then from that substation, it goes out to each of the individual buildings. Now, Wallingford, when they're buying their utility for the town in the day ahead market, places a bid. All they're going to be doing as our asset manager is placing the bid. And the funds to close on, we'll call it like a stock trade, the funds are already going to be in an account. Uh, Wallingford's discretion. They're going to say, we want you to have $2 million or five or whatever the number is in an account. And on top of that, we want you to have a letter of credit. This is done all throughout the industry. This isn't something that's it's new for Wallingford and for Connecticut. It's done everywhere in the country. There's a data center. It's simple. So as far as the numbers and the, and the scale, it makes no difference. It's a couple of wires coming off the 345 going to a substation, which, which we're paying for. All of the utility lines we're paying for. And then Wallingford is buying wholesale electricity and making a profit through the lines that we upgraded by selling it to us. So I wanted to be clear about that. It's a huge win. If you go down and talk to Groton, it, they know it's a huge, huge win for the electric. It's going to generate an awful lot of profit that Wallingford otherwise wouldn't see. In fact, it should generate well more by 25% more than the hosting agreement generates in a specific 32 megawatt example. So it's a lot of money. Thank you. I, I appreciate the explanation. Um, it all sounds great again, but at the same time, um, it's it's a good marketing strategy. You you make it all sound great. Um, if I understand correctly, that's how it correct. happens, happens across the country. It's nothing that I've created. It's something that I've studied, learned about, and try to fit it to the metrics of Connecticut. And that was the whole idea from the start to make Connecticut fit the national mold, find the delta, and make it fit. And we're we're almost there. I mean, we just have to. Uh, wrap up this hosting fee agreement. I appreciate that again, but I understand, do I understand correctly that you have not met with Wallingford Electric yet? We've been trying like we, you don't know, we've been trying, but they would <laughs> like us to get this, this done first. We have three other inked electrical uh, term sheets uh, in Connecticut, and we'd like to make this one happen, but we haven't been able to do it because I think the, the town wants to see this uh, before they wind up the negotiation there. Uh, when I say wind up, before they start the negotiation on the electric side. And, and that would be a question. Um, why do we need the hosting agreement before we know anything about uh, the electric or part? Well, they know, they know everything. This has been ISO New England tested and so forth. They, know, they have the copies of the agreement. They had, they had those copies in the second week, first or second week of March, and then we sent them again. But I think it's just a question of time and resources, and I respect that for the town. Uh, so I think they wanted to make sure that before we started negotiating for electricity, that the town councilors had the chance to look at an agreement and, you know, and adjudicate. Yeah, I would. I would just like. I I try to wrap that up. I would just like um, to ask the town council that they get some sort of input, some sort of feedback from the electric division before they decide on this. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Ellis from the Wallingford Land Trust. Hello, yes. And I'll try to go off video if you want to see me. Um, hello, yes. So Dave Ellis from the, uh, I'm a board of directors of the Wallingford Land Trust. And they wear uh, one of the abutters, maybe the biggest abutter. The uh, property between the site and Route 15 is 68 acres of orchard in Spruce Glen. Um, which was actually donated to the uh, land trust when the Barnes Industrial Park was created. So part of the 
when that was created, the uh, that area was uh, was set aside. Um, it has two streams, two and a half miles of trails, and the only waterfall in in Wallingford. It's a it's probably the second most popular hiking area in town, uh, next to maybe Tyler Mill, maybe first. Um, it was a massively visited location during COVID. I mean, everywhere hiking was really a popular activity during COVID, just getting out of the house. And it was very important to the people of Wallingford to have that space available. Um, we are, of course, concerned about the noise, uh, like everybody else. But our bigger, our big concern is that the noise um, regulations that you're proposing mostly talk about neighbors and not about the open space. And um, we're, I'm very concerned that you might abate the noise to the neighbors by directing all the noise right behind the buildings into the open space. And a walk in the, the 60 acres of woods will now be like a walk through Bradley International Airport on the tarmac and this big air conditioning jets flowing constantly, you won't be able to hear the waterfall. So um, I understand data centers. I work in data centers. I'm an IT professional. Um, I've never worked on anything as big as you guys are setting up. Um, and I realize these, uh, it could be taken care of. Um, uh, you know, berms, walls, right earthworks, right plantings, it could, uh, proper positioning, I believe could mitigate it. I would like to see some language in here to request that submit that that be taken into consideration. And I'm not even saying that the noise ordinance needs to be the same as for residential, but I would not want it to be horrendous experience at the expense of of a work a, 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 a area that the people of Wallingford like to uh, to go. And another one, which is maybe more planning and zoning, but I know you're going to do plantings, and it is a pretty uh, pristine natural area back there. We even had a, uh, a program done 10 years ago through Wildlife Habitat Incentive Program where we did a clearing to encourage certain species to grow and we're seeing a lot of new young growth there but if invasive species were to be planted on your site which is right up against our back property which is no more than 50 or 100 feet from the area that was thinned um, those could take over so I would also like to see something and I'll certainly bring this up in planning and zoning that in anything on the Connecticut invasive species list not be planted on the property for uh, landscaping. Um, you like okay, to, I, I, any concern? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. If I could respond to that. So this is the landscaping plan. Outside of screening, which is done at the street line as far away as possible for the building, okay? Data centers are a box on a level playing field with grass around them fenced with security. That's how a data center looks. It's not going to look any different. And regarding sound, it doesn't get blown into the conservation area or blown toward the houses. If you Google this and find it, you'll find out that sound, and if you worked on a data center, one of the newer ones you might know, that the sound is sent vertically. And it's done that on the parapet roof through certain structures that are designed by the sound engineers to channel it vertically. It doesn't go out in any direction and it wouldn't be able to get out in any direction because there's an existing parapet wall on top of each one of these buildings now, which has generator venting and air conditioning. So it's a vertical structure within the parapet wall that doesn't exceed the height of the parapet wall. That's a deflection device. It works very well. They have them. I'm sure we're going to have to use them throughout Wallingford. And, uh, We'll be talking because uh, we haven't worked in a town yet where we haven't donated land. So, and we have uh, something interesting uh, that we are not gonna be able to use due to setbacks. So at some point, as we go forward, when we get to the planning stage, uh, I'll be speaking to you about uh, our intentions there. So uh, we do have a plan for it. We've been in this business a long time and we know that these things are important. And Jim, I appreciate that. We're definitely always interested in, the, in those opportunities. So thank you. I apologize, Mr. Ellis. I wanted Jim to comment on the invasive species because I think that's covered. If I may, go ahead, Jim. So to to uh, Mr. Ellis's point, um, there is current state statute and local regulations which cover the planting of invasive species. Uh, there's no intention to bring anything that's not a native New England plant into the planting schemes. Uh, as, as that's sort of a statewide requirement, not just uh, a, a wish from uh, 
from an environmental perspective. Um, so just we already know that that's an issue that there won't be any intention to bring something that's uh, not native to New England to take over our you know the neighbors or any of that other stuff. So just so you're aware, we're we are following those regulations. Okay, thank you. Those are my comments. Thank you for those. Next up is Bob. Good evening, Bob Gross, Long Hill Road. I um I have a question. If you weren't if you weren't coming to the town for the tax abatement, would you even be coming in front of the council? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm actually in Wallingford for the municipal utility coupled with the tax abatement. You know, so what I'm saying is that this, to me, this is a good use of the property. I mean, because you could get a lot worse in the area. You can have a trash plant. You can have a lot of things that can go in there. You can have more of these warehouses. Um, you are low impact, except for the noise which you're trying to abate as best as possible. You said you had three agreements already, so you have them with other CMAC communities. We're not a CMAC anymore, but we used to be. Are you have the agreements already signed? All signed, they've been executed for two and a half months, yes. Yeah, so my question to you and then is, if Wallingford takes their time with this, and that's not to say that Wallingford should roll over, but, chances are that some of the your you could start building in those communities first because you got to get moving on some of these projects we could be put at the bottom of the list because you you won't have enough to build 10 of them all at once you can't just can't do it yes no or if we don't i didn't come on tonight to discuss our business plan i've been i have been on 150 plane flights in the last couple of years, all through COVID, I haven't stopped. You don't know me, but I start and I never stop until the project's done. I am going to entitle, fully entitle a data center corridor in Connecticut. The EDC director believes it, the governor believes it, the legislature believes it. I'd like you to believe it. Uh, I'm working hard, very, no, no, very I, hard yeah. every single day. And I do believe we will have a number of data buildings, including Wallingford. Wallingford has a unique ability to attract certain types of these businesses due to its latency and due to its fiber connection right at, right at 91. It's a unique situation. I also have that in Groton. So there are some opportunities. So I'd like to get these opportunities. I am not in a holding pattern to wait for another year or anything else. We're not going to lug around land and engineering and and yep. everything else we need to do, it's just not practical. No businessman would do it. That's the point I'm making. That if we for it to um, Councillor Lappins that, or Councillor Chartels, excuse me, that Wallingford doesn't move fast. Well, some of these things you have to move. And if Mr. Ryan has been talking about these for years, the council should be aware that we need to. These are how these things are built. I mean, there's one in Norwalk. I remember when the one in Norwalk was built because it was the old Norden plant. I remember when Norden was taken over. And it was, there's no cars there, but it's it's a data center there. And that's why I know that it's there. So um, I don't see why the town, I mean, to the counselors, this is something that, in my opinion, that, and other people's, this is a win for Wallingford, I would think. Um, what are you gonna do with that land? Your chances, you know, if you get another Amazon wants to come in there and build another warehouse with hundreds of cars and trucks coming in per day, the runoff from the, the the oil and so forth. You just got to work around the noise and with technology and so forth. This should be something that they should be able to work out. These places are all over the country. And again, because Connecticut is horrible to deal with, business wise, we don't have them here, but um, we should really have it here. Because um, this is an opportunity for Wallingford to really work on its tax base. Because uh, we're not, we just don't grow that much. I got another question. I'm just looking for it because a lot of the questions were already asked. Ms. Tata asked a lot of the questions I was going to ask. She asked some good questions, of course. Um, the, the buying of electricity, we had just to Ms. Cofer, we had some of those. We have some huge buyers of electricity right now, not as big as this, but we had Bristol Myers, which made their own, they generated their own electricity, but you have Nucor and so forth that are, are E1. Uh, 
they buy huge amounts, but they buy at the wholesale just as, as this company is going to do. Only this company is going to buy a larger amount of electricity and make a better, and they'll make a better deal. But even if we make cents on the kilowatt, that's all you need because they're going to be buying so much. It's it's very beneficial to the town. Um, I'm I'm sure you guys want to get home, so I'm not going to ask the other questions. But just I don't see the I don't see really many negatives here. I hope the town will move forward with this sooner than later. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Con, uh, I'm sorry, Danielle Conway? Yes, thank you. Danielle Conway, 78 Tankwood Road. Uh, so I am speaking to you tonight from one of the parcels that was mentioned earlier as one of only a couple of parcels that has the potential to be severely impacted by this project. Um, right now I have my windows open, I can hear crickets and tree frogs, and on the map that was shown earlier this evening during this meeting, I could clearly see a GIS image of my home directly across from one of the proposed buildings. Uh, to give you some background, I am a lifelong Wallingford resident, and last November my husband and I were fortunate enough to close on our dream home during a crazy seller's market. We used to live downtown, we live right above the bar, I grew up in Terrace Gardens, Anyone locally knows that those are very loud environments. And at this age, I was finally able to find my peace and quiet. I work from home, I'm here all day. So any noise that's gonna be a football field or less from my property is going to severely impact my professional life and my personal life. I very much appreciate the counselor's questions and comments tonight. And I think some very serious questions were raised that warrant more research and consideration. Um, and I just want to reiterate that this has the potential to seriously impact my life. I signed a 30-year mortgage six months ago, and you guys are talking about a 30-year agreement, and that is the longest term for me. So thank you for your time, and I would appreciate your consideration in this matter. Thank you, Andrew Mays. Yeah, I think we're good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Evgenia Mays, and this statement is on behalf of my family. We reside at uh, 76 Tankwood Road, actually, next door to uh, the previous speaker. If I could please ask for the permission uh, for Mr. Rosman to display the uh, map of Site 2, please, if it's possible, again. Mr. Chairman, could you display that map again, please? Thank you. So we, our original intent today was to appeal to the council members not to approve the present host agreement in its current form. Specifically, we respectfully ask that the parcels belonging to North Farms Data Campus directly abutting Tankwood Road and slated to house Building 3 be excluded from the scope of this agreement. The reason for this request is the unprecedented proximity of the Building 3 to the residential properties, approximately 200 feet, which includes the width of Tankwood Road, which obviously wouldn't be able to be used for the purposes of any sound buffers, and which makes this location inherently higher risk than other possible location in terms of successful noise and vibration control, as well as a static impact on the neighborhood. The current draft of the agreement allows buildings up to 45 feet high, and that excludes necessary overtop features. So picture those buildings 200 feet away from a 15 foot single story residential building. If you pull up the pictures of the DeKalb, Illinois facility that Mr. Quinn uh, was earlier referring to, you will see exactly how it looks. And we understand that they're probably remediating measures, like we have a warehouse on the corner of 68, which is actually receded halfway underground. And it's not even facing, it's facing the North Farm Roads, which is much larger road. It's not facing the houses. But at the same time, the design was able to be done the way that you only see one building 
uh, protruding. So it's not as overwhelming, overpowering. We're also very concerned that there might not be a possibility of, self, of setting building three, as you see here on the map, back as been uh, brought up before. The site two, as you can see, is not a continuous land mass. It's a series of interconnected strips of land intermitted with farmland, which, in, which those farmland were seemingly left out of the constructed land. And so the parcel doesn't really provide you that big buffer opportunity to move the building. So we see that versus the previous plans, maps that were put online by the developer, the building four was also within 200 feet of Tankwood Road and the residential uh, parcels. Now the building four you see turned, but there's just no place for building three to be turned or somehow relocated because it's butting against non-contracted property. And this is our concern that this is not gonna change. Um, no hyperscale data center facility exists yet in the country, in this country, in such proximity to the residential area, which by definition means no successful re remediation was commissioned yet as of today under circumstances applicable to building three. Neither there is research available about the impact of incessant HVAC noise and vibration emitted by the hyperscale data centers of this kind on human health and children in particular. We just don't know how much is tolerable and at what threshold the damage starts for the simple reason that these projects are brand new. And in case of proposed building three, also unprecedentedly close to the residential homes. This noise is around the clock. There's no relief for a night, for an hour, or even a minute. And it's not going to be the decibels that we hear now from crickets. It's going to be industrial home. We fear that by nature of the first time project under applying circumstances, the beforehand unknown detrimental consequences will become apparent only upon commissioning of the site. Remediation measures employed will only prove their worth after the fact. No design, however perfectly conceived, is a substitute for the proven track record. And once a multi-million build, multi dollar building is up, it will be too late to do anything about it. Location 200 feet from the nearest residential property leaves very limited opportunities for after the fact remediation. There's basically no margin for error. And I appreciate um, all the safeguards the town is trying to put in, in terms of enforcing noise regulations. But as councillors mentioned before, regulation is good, but how do you enforce it? You close the building? Okay, it's not compliant. What do you do then? We understand that the building location is preliminary, subject to discussion. But if this particular parcel does not provide any opportunity for any relocation, any tweaking with the location, why this parcel is even included in the scope of this agreement. As per terms of the draft agreement, as we understand it, the developer can apply for approval for additional sites as the project progresses. It seems reasonable to us, just as uh, Mr. Ryan quoted Mr. Dickinson before, that upon successful commissioning of other sites, which are located further away from the residential areas, the town would get a chance to make a more informed decision based on what environmental impact resulted from those developments, how successful the remediating measures put in place by the developer were, and what latest public health data is available in regards to such developments in the residential communities. At the risk of sound dramatic, uh, we implore this council to adopt a gradual approach which spares our family and our neighborhood the risks we can hardly afford to bear. Just like the previous speaker, we invested our life savings into this home, and this is all we have. It needs to be done right. And if from now, from even looking at the map, we see that there is no space for Minerva, and we're going to be the first house in the country within 200 feet of this 
may be beautiful, but also carrying unpredictable risk facility, we can't help but be extremely concerned. We understand that we're located across from industrial zone and we need to coexist. But currently the land across from us is actually productively utilized. It's a tree farm. And we learned to live with that. When the tractor passes by, you tell your child to get off the bike because that's what Tankwood Road is used for. Children biking, dogs walking, people juggling. We have, and also I would like to make a comment if I may about day-to-day -day traffic. Um, so if we have two shifts, approximately 25, if we have, if a shift is approximately 25 people and we have a standard shift changes at 11 p.m., right? It's night shift is 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. This is night hours. And so there will be just around 11 p.m. There will be 25 cars coming down and 25 cars leaving on a very, very small street. It doesn't even have a line in the middle. Um, and we don't have AC. Our house is old. We, we sleep with the windows open. So God forbid any of those guys rise at Harley. We will be woken up every midnight, right? So the road use issue as brought up also concerns us a lot. And this is all I have for tonight. Thank you again for the chance to speak to you all. Thank you. All right, uh, next is Mr. Cohan. Um, we're way over time, but so I just ask you to be mindful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I'm gonna be brief. Jeff Cohan, 10 Whispering Pines Drive. Again, full disclosure, I'm on planning and zoning, uh, so I'm not going to ask any land use questions, although a lot came up this evening, that's for sure. Um, I think the council has asked some fantastic questions, and I think you've covered basically every question that I had, with a couple exceptions. And I go back to the original intent of this meeting, which was to work on the host fee. You know, a million dollars sounds like a great number, but I really want to dig into that a little more. You know, to me, it's been based on, you know, megawatt uh, usage. Um, has anybody gone in, verified exactly what equipment can be powered by 32 megawatts of power? And I ask that because, you know, the reason the state did this was, Computer equipment is very expensive and it was taxed at a very high rate. So I could see City coming in, dropping in a half dozen IBM Z15s so they don't pay the New York State tax. And you know those Z15 machines would go over $35 million worth of you know, property. Um, so my question is, you know, ha has anybody really verified that number and, you know, what it really represents as far as the fee to the town? I, I you know, it, it sounds great, um, but I want to make sure the town is getting, you know, the best deal that we can get. You know, the, the developer, Mr. Quinn, has something to gain. I think the town has something to gain as well. And I'd like to see that that number uh, vetted and you know revised. I, I'd like to see how that number came up. Um, and a lot of counselors got into that as well. Um, you know, Mr. Quinn mentioned 500 potential jobs. Mr. Laffin alluded to this. You know, this sounds like great uh, lights out data centers. You know, you're going to have a few people changing failed drives, but you know, I don't, I don't see 500 jobs out of these couple of data centers in in town. You, you're you're smiling, but you know, these can be run from Groton. They could be run from California. No, they cannot be run from Groton. There's on-site people you need for a particular yeah. use. The people we're dealing with have track records. We're dealing with people that have oh, some people have over 50 data centers. I know the exact employee count. I met with the CEO. I've flown to many of their sites. That okay. that is not okay. a qualified remark, Mr. Cohen. And it's late, and and it's a that's a deep dive to get into. But I'll tell you, right. there are jobs coming with data centers for 
certain in Wallingford. You can count whatever count you want. I will not refute it, but there were jobs coming and there's going to be quite a few. I, over I, don't, I don't disagree, but I, I really don't want to have a, a really rosy, unrealistic picture painted. And, you know, you, you, you got to qualify some of the comments that have been made. And, and the last comment I'll make is about the sound. Um, planning and zoning, when an application comes, um, we can put uh, restrictions on sound. That's about it. If the sound level exceeds the ordinance, that's out of our jurisdiction. Um, and that was proven with the Oakdale fiasco we had years ago. Um, if the noise is exceeded, it's up to the town to enforce the, the noise ordinance. So I just want to make that clear. We can do certain things, but we can't um, enforce that. Mr. So, institutional uh, money is going to come to this level. Institutional. These are the largest banks in the world and investment funds. No one is going to screw around with the noise ordinance. That's that's just not going to happen. These are bonded jobs every step of the way. There's only three companies in the world. There's plenty of companies that insure them, but only three that reinsure these companies. OK, and the, we know what the metrics are. No one's going to try to get around or have a mistake with sound. These are going to be heavily vetted, very expensive buildings, and no one's going to go into this in a has haphazard fashion. Yes, you, you've mentioned that, but I'm, I'm just clarifying what it's going to take, you know, for the town council and, you know, anybody on the public that's listening, because, you know, it has been a concern that's been brought up by, by everybody. And I, I understand. We want to be in Wallingford, but if Wallingford doesn't want us to be there, we will not be there. It's up to the town council. We, we put uh, our best foot forward. We've done an exorbitant amount of work with all of the landowners. We have a massive in current investment in Wallingford, far than anything you might want to imagine at this time. Between attorneys, engineers, prepping all this work, we have made a major commitment to the town of Wallingford and put our very best efforts forward. If Wallingford doesn't want us, we'll go somewhere else. But I'm trying to put a deal together because we really like Wallingford and Wallingford has unique benefits in the Connecticut Data Corridor. So, you know, look, we're willing to cooperate. You're going to find out I'm easy to work with. I've been, a, I've been before many boards, many, many boards, much of my life. I know how to put these things together. These nice people, the uh, maze that just were on, we're going to work on, on these buildings. We had to put this together because the town requested it. We want to work with the town. You'll find out that Len Fasano and I will work with you as best we possibly can. We have other attorneys too, locally. So if, uh, if you give us the opportunity, we'll show yes. you our best and, slide and we'll try and to make I, this. I, I, I can't say whether or not you, 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 I, you know, whether or not I, I hope you get the opportunity since I sit on the board, but I, I expect to see you at a planning and zoning meeting. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank All you. Right. We've got, we're over time, but we've got two more speakers. If we could be mindful of that and wrap this up, I would appreciate it. So next is Jocelyn Polanski, name and address for the record, please. Um, actually, it's Jessica Polanski, and I live at 1039 North Farms Road, and I am a fifth-generation Wallingford resident and taxpayer, and a third-generation resident who lives on North Farms Road. So I have a very long history of North Farms Road, and I also like hearing the tree frogs and crickets in nature as the previous residents, um, and I really that matters, that matters to all of us. And I just, I know that this can be extremely advantageous for the town, but I ask that you really respect the neighborhoods that are going to surround these buildings. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying about the noise pollution, and that is a very serious concern, but I am trusting that you are going to safeguard if this does go through. Um, I just, I know that we're, you know, crazy late, but I just had a couple questions about um, Mr. Fasano talking about possibly having to access North Farms Road should this go through. 
And I just wanted to add, you know, if there isn't an issue going through the wetland area, is that completely going to be taken off the board? And if it is an issue and North Farms and Tech would have to be accessed, once these are done, which it sounds like construction would be for possibly up to five years if I think somebody said it was 18 months for each building. So is that 18 months consecutive, like one after the other? So would North Farms and Tankwood and these roads be impacted for years while these are being built? And if that is the case and the res residents have to go through this, will those, um, will it be taken off where, boy, I'm really kind of mixing up my words and not articulating my point. But my concern is, which I stated previously, and Mr. Quinn had mentioned that he had, you know, he was on North Farms Road and he saw tractor trailers and dump trucks. And again, just please be mindful that this is a residential area and we already have over pollution as far as these big vehicles, the tractor trailers and the dump trucks speeding down our road. We've got little kids who get on school buses. Like I said, you, you can't even take a peaceful walk or a jog on this road anymore. So I just ask that you be very mindful of that and just be very considerate of the fact that those of us who do live in this area for the reasons that previous speakers have spoken about, pre previous residents have, just please respect that because you know we're trying to really get on board and respect the fact that this can be good for Wallingford. And just my last question, um, and forgive me if this is a stupid question, but I really just don't know. With so much of the property um, under Eversource power lines, and I don't know if I misheard you, um, if you said that contracts aren't in place with Wallingford Electric, will there be safeguards and contracts eventually put in place so these companies have to get their electricity through Wallingford Electric to make it advantageous for our town? Because what would prevent them from possibly hooking directly into the substation and then not paying Wallingford Electric? Okay, so just so you know, it would only be only be 100% only be through Wallingford Electric. Eversource will run it with we. That would be the proposition. This is Janice um, Small speaking. Um, legally, they, they have to go through the town of Wallingford's electric division. Okay. So I just, I, like I said, I can't, I know we're late and I just can't stress it enough. Just please take into consideration that you know, if this is going to be great and advantageous and it's going to work out for everybody, just please um, put the buildings as far away from the residents that you possibly could, because like, it's very upsetting. Like I said, I've, I'm a third generation human being living on this street. And it's very upsetting to think that I could look behind me and I believe it's building five that could possibly, you know, impede my view. It, it's very upsetting. So if I, I don't know, you know, in trying to be respectful of the time and the money that you've put into your plans, you know, my only other question is, is that when plans were developed, why were plans right on top of residential areas, neighborhoods that, that people in homes are going to look out and possibly see this? So I think that good can come if you could kind of hide these buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Appreciate your comments. Mr. DeMeo. Yes, good evening. This is Bob DeMeo in 14 Marie Lane. Just a few quick comments, um, really brief. Financially, obviously, it's hard not to like what this can bring to town. Um, I believe it's certainly a better use for both the town and residents than the warehousing and e-commerce delivery hubs that, you know, don't seem to want to stop. However, I think this town has done a pretty good job over a long period of time by dotting its I's and crossing its T's. And, you know, to me, if there was ever a time to put some of that extra due diligence in, this is it. I mean, listening to this conversation tonight, I worry a little bit that the counselors may not have enough real information on noise 
which you know impacts scale to me. Unless you fully understand the noise, I'm not sure how you can commit to scale. So I think using a noise consultant was a good step. Seems like though to me, again, not being knowing all the details here, obviously, seems like someone needs to to make that real for the council. You know, you guys joked about a site visit, but why not? I mean, find a site in New Jersey. If that's where there's a comparable site, visit it, listen, record some audio and video. Um, I think the town owes it to the residents to be 100% sure on the noise for a project this big. Um, you know, I think it could be a big win for the town, but it's just too big not to be sure on the noise. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, if I may, for a moment. Sure. So obviously, after listening to the concerns, um, but we are a little bit under the gun on uh, timing issue. Um, and I think that perhaps I can have further conversations with uh, uh, Attorney Small, Attorney Farrell, and Mayor Dickinson on the road issue, uh, perhaps, and we can clean up some of the other odds and ends. Um, we would not want to put people in a position of liking this as a concept, but un not comfortable with the language and therefore voting no or voting yes and being put in an uncomfortable spot. So would the council be so kind as to indulge us in a meeting next Tuesday, giving us the rest of this week to work out the smaller details, or I shouldn't say smaller details, work out the rest of the details uh, with the town administration and put us on for, I know it's a special meeting, but we would ask, we've worked so hard as a group both sides of the table and come so far, um, the hourglass is running. So we would just ask very respectfully if that would be okay. Um, I will, what we'll do is I'll send out an email to the council asking for their availability for Tuesday. Uh, and we'll, we'll notice that tomorrow if there's gonna be uh, enough in attendance. So- uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll we'll put this over. Thank you. Presume, presuming all goes as well as it possibly can, we'll we'll have a special meeting a week from today to discuss this issue. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, obviously, we've spent a great deal of time on this because it's something we're taking very seriously. Just putting aside before we got to the public comment. Um, the public comment was twice what our rules allow and because I wanted the residents to feel heard, uh, to be heard. Um, so with that, we have three items or at least two items for executive session. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I just wanna make a comment. With all due respect, I'm not meeting next Tuesday. They can get on our regular agenda on 622. That's ridiculous. I mean, we already had one special meeting on this on May 18th, we coupled it with that. We still have like five things on the agenda tonight. So no, I'm a no, I'll say it publicly. You can poll people now publicly and maybe, you know, versus an email, but just wanna put we that out there. We don't have the whole council on and you, you keep telling me you're a no. So I'm really not sure whether or not, you know, just meeting around your schedule is, is what's important here. So thank you for your care. Well, it's not around my schedule. I just think that, that we've bent over backwards. And I think there's a double standard with the council when we want to get, get stuff on, we, we've had meeting requests, agenda items denied because they missed the deadline by a few hours, but this stuff just trickles in and there's no consequence because it's, it's the administration. So that's where I'm coming from, but thank you. All right. I guess you'll hear from us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the indulgence to the council. Appreciate the time. Uh, Mr. Mayor, do we have anything for item 13? If I did, I'd tell you no, but it's no. All right, so uh, on 14 and 15, we have executive session. Mr. Chairman, I move we go into executive session pursuant to Connecticut General Statutes, section 1225F and section 1206B regarding strategy and negotiations with respect to the pending tax appeal matter 
of Bear Industries, LLC versus Town of Wallingford, and for the discussion regarding the pending claims and litigation involving Covanta and the disposal agreements. Is there a second? Second. All right. Moved and seconded. All those in favor of going into executive session signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, I declare the council in executive session. Please, if you're not participating in the executive session, exit the meeting. Thank you. This conference will now be recorded. This conference will now be recorded. All right, council is back in public session. Is there a motion to come out of executive session? So I move to come out of executive session. Second. Councilor Zandri, you can have the second. Yeah. Don't worry about <laughs> it. Uh, all those in favor of coming out of executive session signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, I declare the council back in public session. Uh, we need a motion on item 16, please. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the tax appeal settlement for, between Bear Industries for the town of Wallingford as discussed in executive session. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on the motion? There being none. Uh, you know what, I'm going to take the roll. So those in attendance at this point, Councillor Lappin? Yes. Councillor Marone? Yes. Uh, Councillor Tata? Yes. Councillor Testa? Yes. Councillor Zandri? Yes. I vote yes. The motion passes. There being no further agenda to, I mean, no further business to discuss, I declare this meeting adjourned. Everybody have a lovely evening or what's left of it.